All right, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, so when everyone's ready, I'd uh, like to call this meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Uh, Tess, could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Maxwell? McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. And both Commissioner Maxwell and Commissioner Gordon are absent with notification. Uh, commissioners, are there any statements of disqualification for the items on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, I'm now going to open the mic for oral communications. This is a time to come talk to us if you want to on any items not on the agenda tonight. So we open up the mic uh, in the sake of democracy. So if you'd like to come speak with us about something else, feel free. All right, seeing none, we'll move past oral communications and into the approval of minutes. So we need to reapprove the minutes of August 3rd, 2023. I did the wrong procedure at our last meeting and forgot to call for a vote. So these are the same minutes resubmitted. Um, another clarification from the city attorney is that you can vote on minutes even if you weren't at the meeting. So we have been doing that wrong as well. And that'll help when we have people absent and it's mm -hmm. hard to, because you're just certifying that the minutes reflect the meeting, not anything more than that. So with those two clarifications, is there a motion to approve the minutes of August 3rd? I'll, I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? I think you have to vote no, though. Oh, you're going to abstain. Okay. You can't abstain? Well, that's a new rule. No, it's in the document. Oh. It's, it's an old <laughs> rule that we just forgot. Okay. So if you're comfortable voting no, it just yeah. means. I'll, yeah. I'll, be, I'll vote no. Okay. This all just landed on my desk, too, so I'm uh, absorbing it. Sorry. Okay, so you got that? Good, now I'd like to open the public hearing. We have two items on the agenda tonight. Our first item, oh, excuse me, uh, do, do, do. I'm off here, one second. Yeah, so our first uh, agenda item is 1800 Soquel Avenue. Uh, can we get a staff report, please? Yes, good evening. Uh, this is Ryan Bain, senior planner. Um, before we, before you tonight, we have a project at 18, 1800 SoCal Avenue. Um, the, uh, it's a, about a 0.1 acre project site that consists of, concurrently consists of three parcels um, located on the southeast corner of SoCal Avenue and, and Hagman Avenue. Um, it's a, the commercial uses around the site, um, with the exception of uh, residential to the south. Um, the flat site's mostly paved, um, commercial building constructed in the early 1960s. That's going to be proposed for demolition. And uh, the site has had a number of different uses over the past few years, uh, including the used car dealership, uh, restaurant, and other auto-related uses. Um, there are no trees located on the site, though there are some um, street trees along Soquel Avenue that are going to be retained. So the project involves a uh, proposal to construct a, a four-story mixed-use project um, at grade parking um, on the first floor, uh, about 1,900 square foot commercial space, um, and then 84 flexible density units. And I should note that, and I may uh, preface that there's a condition of approval that refers to adding some retail space um, along the SoCal frontage. And the applicant uh, in the last couple of days has basically, to address that condition, made some um, revisions to that first floor already. And so um, there'll be some changes, some minor changes um, to that from what in, what's in your packet. And I'll address that as we go along. 
So we'll be seeing that for the first time. Correct. Now. Yes. Okay. Basically, it meets the condition of approval that was part of your packet. So he's basically implemented it. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in implementing that, it also moves things around and ch changes a few things up. So I'll, I'll address that. So the general plan designation is community commercial. Um, basically, that designation calls for businesses that serve the general needs of the community, including retail, service, office, typical uses, restaurant, grocery, et cetera, uh, as well as mixed use projects that include these commercial uses on the ground floor. So the, as proposed, it's consistent with that designation. Um, floor area ratio for that designation allows 0.25 to 1.75. The proposed FAR is 2.45. And that is going to be one of the waiver requests as part of the density bonus. Um, there's numerous general plan policies that it's consistent with, um, all of which are listed in the uh, staff report. Um, so I just provided a couple of key ones here, um, talking about discouraging strip commercial development, um, cluster commercial and mixed use development along transit corridor, encourage higher density intensity residential uses, maximum densities, um, allowing and encouraging the high end of the general plan land use density, encouraging the assembly of small parcels, um, consistent with all these policies. Um, it's also located in the east side business area improvement plan, um, and specifically in the east Soquel zone of that plan. And there are several goals that it meets there, including large scale buildings, pedestrian oriented, retail storefront, wider sidewalks, oriented toward the street, and parking screen. So um, the uh, development has been designed to meet all of these east side business area improvement guidelines. So before you tonight, um, what we're looking at is um, several different types of permits that are included in the package. Um, one being the non-residential demolition authorization permit for demolishing the existing commercial structure, a boundary adjustment to combine the three parcels, um, a design permit, a special use permit, and then the density bonus request. So as I mentioned, uh, for the non-residential demolition authorization permit, uh, that per commercial structure is proposed to be demolished. Um, it was constructed in 1961 with later additions and has had various changes over the years. Uh, it's not listed and not eligible for listing on the City Historic Building Survey. Oops, went the wrong way. And as I mentioned, so there's three current parcels that are being merged. Um, also part of that boundary adjustment, um, there's gonna be a dedication of a little over 1,600 square feet um, that's going to be dedicated along Soquel and Hagman Avenue for street widening and sidewalk expansion. So the resulting parcel will be 0.1 acres, which meets the um, minimum requirement for, of 8,000 square feet for mixed use in the CC zoning. Um, so the zoning district for, this, for these parcels is CC. Um, the purpose of the CC listed in our zoning ordinance is to provide locations throughout the community for a variety of commercial and service uses for residents, um, encourage a harmonious mixture of a wide variety of commercial and residential activities, um, and then limited industrial uses that are compatible. Um, I should also mention that a special use permit and design permit are required for FDU developments, flexible um, dwelling, flexible flexible density in it, sorry, um, of 16 or more units, as well as for mixed residential and commercial developments with 10 or more multiple dwelling units above commercial. So a special use permit and design permit are also um, part of this um, proposed application. So in terms of CC development standards, um, it's meeting all of the requirements of the zoning district with the exception of height, and that's one of the uh, requested density bonus waivers. So the CC zoning allows for three stories, 40 feet, and this proposed project is four stories, 46 feet. So six feet over what the zoning would normally allow.
So the proposed projects um, consist of three stories of residential units above ground level retail and parking with a footprint that covers the majority of the site area. Um, vehicular access uh, to the garage is provided via a 15 foot alleyway that runs along the south side of the property. Um, that it basically connects Hagman and Forest Avenues. Um, the first floor consists of about 1,900 square feet of retail space <laughs> here at the corner of Hagman and Soquel, uh, including an adjacent outdoor dining area um, for potential future restaurant or food service. Um, additionally, there's a residential lobby with a mail room that's accessed from Soquel. Um, and so, as well, and then along Hagman we have some trash, that's where the uh, trash enclosure access is. And then as I mentioned, one of the conditions of approval uh, included um, including an additional 45 feet of frontage along Soquel to really extend the, the retail presence and frontage along Soquel. So the applicant um, has included this area right here as an additional 45 feet of, of retail frontage. It's a little under 1,000 square feet of of additional retail to the 1900 that was originally proposed. And um, before that was like a, a penciled in bike room and like a transformer room it looked like or something like that? Correct, there was a storage room, um, which that's one of the requirements for flexible density units, is provide a certain cubic um, feet of, of storage and then as well as uh, meeting the bike uh, requirements, class one bike requirements. So both of those have been moved um, and that does affect a couple things. The bike parking has been moved to the second level, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then some of the storage has been distributed here in the parking area. Um, so basically, it's kind of, you would pull in kind of under the storage, and the storage would be um, there. You can kind of pull in underneath it. So that's been distributed throughout the parking area. So each individual unit would basically have their own storage space. So here's just taking a look at some of the renderings of the proposed project. This is uh, from uh, Soquel Avenue. You can see the retail space here on the corner. Uh, here's the lobby entrance here. And then this is the additional retail space that they've uh, provided. There's another angle from kind of northwest elevation showing along the Hagman. And then this is kind of from the southeast, from the backside, showing the alleyway. And uh, there's some second floor um, open space as well. So this is the second level. Um, this has a lot of the open space area. Um, and as I had mentioned, there was a community room here, and, and, and uh, kind of a small community room, but that met the, the minimum 200-foot requirement and that bike room has been moved up here. So um, with that being said, um, there's a new waiver that's being, um, that's being requested um, for that 200 square feet of community room, a waiver to that. Um, I should mention that the proposed 84, there's 84 flexible density units, um, 42 are the 432 square foot um, studios, and then the other 42 are 615 square foot one bedrooms. So as I mentioned, flexible density unit, our ordinance has some minimum requirements for those. Um, there's a certain square footage range which they're, they're well within. Um, the storage facility, um, as I mentioned, they, they had been meeting it. Um, it was 16,800 is the requirement. And they had been providing 17,800, I believe. And then with, um, with them complying with the retail, providing the retail space and having to move some of that around, they're just a little bit under the requirement now. Um, so that'll be one of the waiver requests. Bike parking, um, they are asking for a waiver to that. 84 is what is required, and they're, asking, and they're providing 73. And then for the usable open space, um, they're also asking for a waiver 
and then they meet the laundry facilities. Each, my understanding is each unit will have its own uh, washer and dryer. In regards to parking, um, under AB, AB 2097, um, which was effective um, on January of this year, it prohibits uh, local jurisdictions from imposing minimum parking requirements. Um, most development projects located within a half mile of a major transit stop, so this, this project is within that half mile, and so they're actually not required to provide any parking, um, but they will be providing 78 parking spaces. Um, that's another, I should mention, that's another amendment to... All right, so uh, I'd like to remind everyone this is a public forum. Please be quiet and respectful. We'll do the same when it's your turn. Uh, Ryan, can you underscore that that's a state law that we don't have any control over, that parking thing? Correct. That is a state law that's been implemented, and, and cities and counties have no choice but to follow that. So um, by law, in, through along these corridors, um, we cannot require any parking. Um, so, um, but they are, they were originally providing 75 spaces. Um, another revision that was, that also, actually I should go back and show you is that there was parking that's located along the alleyway and those were originally angled. Um, and with the alleyway being two way, we thought it'd be best to have those at 90 degrees. So basically instead of when they're pulling out, they can go either direction and leave that option. And, and with doing that, uh, revision, they actually gained a, three additional spaces. So it's gone from 75 to uh, 78. So um, offsite improvements, there's a few. Um, as I mentioned, there was a dedication of a little over 1,600 square feet of right away. So as part of that dedication, they'll be um, widening uh, parts of uh, Hagman and Soquel there at the corner. They'll be re relocating uh, new traffic signals, poles, and equipment. Um, there'll be a, a dedicated left turn lane that there isn't currently. Um, there'll be sidewalk expansion, so there'll be a 10-foot sidewalk along Soquel and 8-foot along Hagman, which is following the uh, east side business plan area um, design guidelines. Um, also, under all, under all utilities will be undergrounded. Um, the 15-foot alleyway will be repaved. And um, there'll be two new street lights. I think there's one along Hagman and one new one along Soquel, and then three new street trees um, along Hagman. Um, there's a density bonus request um, as part of this. So he's provided the the applicants provided plans for a base project that meets all of the CC development standards, including height, setbacks, and open space. And it was determined that the base, the base density under those requirements is 67. So um, density bonus is basically calculated off of that base density of 67. Uh, and with the, um, the project requesting a 32.5% density bonus, um, they'll be providing a minimum of, <clears throat> excuse me, seven very, <laughs> very low income units, 50% um, AMI, and seven low income units at 80% MI. AMI um, for a total of 14 low-income units, which meets our city inclusionary um, requirement. So um, for the density bonus waivers that are being requested, um, as I mentioned, one is to exceed the maximum height, going from 40 to 46. Um, the FAR, which is uh, allowed a maximum of 1.75 to 2.45. And then for bike parking, going from 84 to 73. The usable open space would be going from the 12,600 to 6,700. Um, as I mentioned, the storage uh, from 6, 16,800 to 14,244 cubic feet. And then, as I mentioned, the, the indoor common space requirement of 200 square feet that was replaced with the uh, relocation of the bike parking. And so, Ryan, I don't mean to interrupt, but hmm? could we talk about waivers? If we don't like them, can we stop them? Like as a planning commission? Again, this is a state law. Mm -hmm. and so, I just want to say this a few times for everyone on TV. Yeah, and, it's, and all the it's a whole here. new, it's a, yeah. Um, so the project, the applicant's allowed to request as many waivers uh, for, from development standards as needed if development standard would preclude the density bonus project from being built at that allowed density. So um, essentially, 
uh, that's how we determine these waivers. So we really don't, the city must grant these waivers unless they violate state or federal law, mm -hmm. create a specific adverse impact on health or safety or the physical environment that can't be mitigated or adversely impact real property listed on the California Register of Historical Resources, which this isn't. So um, there really is no evidence that the waivers requested should not be granted as, as required by state law. Okay, and then just from, well, never mind, I'll ask that question later. Uh, thanks okay. for going through that again. Sure. Um, there was a community outreach meeting um, per our outreach policy back in May. Um, <coughs> staff, as well as the, uh, the applicants, and then approximately 42 members attended. Um, it was noticed with signage on the property, notices mailed to property owners and tenants within 1,000 feet, as well as advertised on the city's website. So um, there was discussion items involving um, concerns about traffic, parking, intersection safety as it relates to bike lanes, and as well as impacts to the public alley. Um, there were also, you know, there were also uh, attendants that were in support of the project, specifically regarding um, eliminating the current uses, which have been a nuisance to some of the, the, the nearby neighbors, as well as um, supporting high density housing and affordable housing. So, in addition to the webinar, uh, we, as we have for most of our larger projects, we have a web page that was created. Um, on our on our city website for people to be able to um, see the plans and and look at all of the information on the project so uh, CEQA provides categorical exemptions which are applicable to categories of projects and activities that the lead agency, lead agency has determined uh, do not pose a risk of significant impacts on the environment um, the project has been determined to be exempt from CEQA under Categorical exemption um, section 15332 for infill development. Um, through discussions with the applicant between the packet going out and tonight, there was a couple of requests by the applicant regarding a couple of the conditions of approval, um, as well as cl it's mainly mostly clarification type um, things um, for condition. 26, um, the applicant requested that we add some language, giving some leeway to the planning director to be able to issue a demolition permit um, prior to the issuance of the building permit for the project. Normally, we require those be um, issued together. Um, so if there is some type of special circumstance or something that, that the, that the it's giving the planning director a little bit of discretion if they wanted to issue it. Our general idea is that we'd want to issue it together, but if we were at a point in the plan check process where um, the project was, you know, there was only a couple of small comments that needed to be addressed, um, and it was very close to being able to be uh, issued, that we could uh, let them do some demolition, you know, a week or two prior. So that's so they something. So that can make the overall construction period shorter in theory um, and then it was pointed out that we kind of had a boilerplate bike parking um, condition and it was pointed out that it's actually you know because of the the density bonus request the waiver um, we needed to reword that so to indicate that it's providing the 73 bike parking spaces and then this is another kind of boilerplate one that um, they, they just had some concerns about the wording, and so we, we broadened it a little bit um, in terms of allowing some substantial deviations from the, the colors. So in terms of recommendation, we're, um, we're recommending that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and that we're recommending approval of the non-residential demolition authorization permit, the boundary adjustment, design permit, special use permit, and density bonus requests, uh, including the requested waivers um, that I discussed for the proposed project based on the findings and the conditions that were provided in the staff report. And I'm available for any questions 
And I should mention that the applicant does have a presentation as well as um, there is a neighborhood group that has a presentation as well. Okay, so commissioners, do you have questions for staff? I, I do have one question. Commissioner McKelvey? Was there a, we discussed earlier um, the definition of the alleyway as a thoroughfare. Is that something that has come from a definition either in public works or in planning uh, the zoning ordinance, or is there a definition for a thoroughfare that includes alleys? I don't believe an alleyway would be considered a thoroughfare. Um, I'm asking. I want to take a look and see what our def in our in our zoning code. If there's a definition, do you have one? This um, is the person I'm I'm looking yeah. for. <laughs> Good evening, mm -hmm. Curtis, who's our public works engineering. Uh, it is in Title 15. It's considered a street. A street. Alleyway. Okay. And it's not, it's not named or, I mean, it is, it is dedicated as a public Correct. way. Okay. So, so someone might have put that name on there, but typically we don't name alleys. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson. I just had a couple questions. Um, so it, it talks about improvements to the alley and I saw that it was going to be paved, and I may have missed it, so apologies. Um, what other improvements are proposed for the alleyway? Well, it's going to be paved. I mean, that's specific to the alley. It's going to be paved. Um, that is a requirement of public works for most projects that are adjacent to an alleyway. So if the alleyway is in pretty bad shape, they're required to upgrade it and pave it. Um, in addition to the alley being paved, it's act, it's on the actual project property, but um, there'll be this there'll be this parking that's uh, uh, along the backside that uses the alleyway for backup space, um, and there'll be in addition to the alley being paved, there'll be another additional ten feet or so um, from the parking space to the actual property line. So the alleyway will actually go from about 15 foot to about 20, 25 feet in width for the span of, of, the, of the property. Okay. Um, and then in addition to that, even though it's not technically in the alleyway, but um, adjacent to the alleyway, it'll feel like it's part of the alleyway, so there's also some landscaping um, that's uh, there as well. Great. I just had a couple more. Sure, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things that we're considering tonight is the issuance of a special use permit. And so I just wanted to clarify for the public and myself that so um, when a project is consistent with like our general plan and the improve business area improvement plan, which this proposed location is, um, are we compelled by law to issue a special use permit or is that something we have purview to decide yes or no on? So you're asking, basically, I mean, there's certain findings for the special use permit. And so we just need to make sure that it meets the findings to issue the special use permit. Yeah, well, what, I, what I'm trying to clarify is that there are many things that we are compelled to do, right? Um, I think um, chair, the chair was pointing out some of those things, right, along the density bonus and, and the Affordable Housing Act, some of those things we don't really have, um, we're compelled by existing law to do. What I'm trying to understand is issuing a special use permit as is required for us to consider, right? Because we're more than 16 units, are we compelled by law to issue a special use permit? My answer would be yes. I mean, the fact that the special use permit is required in order to build housing. Mm -hmm. And so, since that is part of the application, I think that does fall under the Housing Accountability Act. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I think I had Good question, one though. more. Um, I did just have a question that I saw in uh, one of the comments received, and I don't know the answer to this, so that's why I want to put it out early. Um, a neighboring business was concerned about um, the three parking spaces on Soquel and having some kind of protection for those. What are the options 
to do that, or are there any options to do that? Protection meaning keeping them for the retail businesses as opposed to um, the residents of the development. I might call uh, Curtis up here. I don't. I don't think Curtis is aware or has seen. We just received that letter. Okay. Um, like this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you have a? I don't know if I have a copy of that. I don't think I have. I, I'm, I just don't know what the options are for protecting those spaces from um, residents parking there. So could we take a minute to, and just put that up? I mean, I saw like 15 plans, but it'd be helpful for me to see the to see the, the parking spots we're talking about. I don't know. Let's see, I might, Sorry to put you I might be able spot. to show it on the aerial. Okay. Yeah, you can see it. That so helps, that helps. thank you. Yeah. I, I, so the property owner of the neighboring property here, um, there. I think this is what he was referring yep, to here. Right there. There's so when this property right was there. developed, thank you. They required that they provide on-street parking along here. So his concern, and I'm just trying to remember his letter from a couple hours ago was that you know any overflow from here that people might park and take these spaces and not allow for his customers to be able to park there and he was asking if there's any way for the city to be able to put up signage that limits only customers of his businesses to use those parking spaces yeah that's a possibility there's about two hour parking I have to check with traffic engineering, but it would make sense. The park, that's the inset parking. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's Correct. Yes. Yeah. No, that would. That's that's not an issue. <laughs> Great. Thank you. That that was helpful. Just wanted to put it out there, since we're going to be talking about a lot of things. Um, Commissioner Williams. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just had. Uh, Couple quick questions. So I thought I heard you say the the washer dryer situation was going to go to one per unit. And are those did I did I hear that correctly? Yes, the FDU ordinance requires. Um, there's a minimum requirement. And I'm trying to remember what it was. I remember uh, but seeing. I think they're the, more than exceeding it. Actually, they're, uh, yes. they're. I believe they're proposing that each unit have its own washer dryer uh, unit. Yeah. <laughs> and I. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, I, I saw the minimum on the washer dry unit. And are those going to be contained in each individual unit, or are those going to be consolidated somewhere else on the property? Or they're going to be in each unit. Yeah, it okay. show it shows if you look in each of the units. I believe there is a little closet that shows uh, stacked. Stacked. Yeah. Nice. Correct. Okay. Great. And then um, my other question was also about the alleyway. Um, know that we had a little back and forth about that and now that they're at a 90 I was doing some digging just through municipal code and I guess the reason I'm asking this is because neighbors are concerned that you know using the public alley is going to be a little bit more limited a little bit more dangerous um, just because of the cars coming in and out and I was digging through code and it said that when parking spaces are at a 90 degree angle there's some sort of minimum amount of space behind them that needs to be allocated and the reason I'm asking is, be, you know, basically trying to explore the options of what we can do to protect maybe a little bit of that thoroughfare for pedestrian traffic, if there, that's even a possibility. Um, I know that's, yeah, that's well, my What Sorry. it refers to generally is a 24-foot um, a backup space is at a standard. Um, and, but there are, there are portions of our ordinance that do allow for some variations in that. I think as proposed here, um, with this 90 degree, um, it's at 22 and change, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I actually talked with Curtis briefly about this. And one of the things that Public Works wanted to have was just a, um, uh, a maneuvering diagram that basically shows that that 22 is sufficient enough to. to, to uh, so the applicant would have to submit a, a turning diagram like on a uh, turn to cat, auto cat, some sort of diagram showing that it is feasible. It's not like a five point turn. 22 feet is more than enough feet typically to back out. We approve those on a regular basis. And let me butt in real quick while Curtis is up here. In my experience, being up here many years, it's real common to kind of like fine tune those things between now and the actual project being built. I think we have a condition that says work with public works to get all these details nailed down. 
could jump in there too. The um, it's actually in our code. It allows for um, an applicant to submit a new claim at the end of the very beginning of the process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, where did my? Uh, what Samantha said or what I said? Does my mic work? Uh, yeah. It okay. sounds okay to me. Can you all hear it out there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's actually in our code, it's in our ordinance, and it allows for um, an applicant to submit a turning diagram to reduce the amount of back out space. So it's not like a special thing or anything. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, more questions? I kind of got you out there. Oh, no, we're good. Commissioner Conway? I was gonna wait until after the applicant has Okay. I, I just had one uh, just for staff. I'm really focused on the streetscape. I really appreciate getting more commercial, even though it's really small. Thank you for that. But Ryan, could you just kind of walk us down that sidewalk? We're getting a wider sidewalk. Are we keeping or replacing the three street trees that are on that frontage, like on SoCal? Yeah, there's currently three street trees along here that are proposed to be retained. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sidewalk will be widened to a uh, minimum 10, 10 foot. And that's there's some dedication of some of the property um, to increase the width of the right of way to allow for that uh, 10 foot sidewalk, eight foot along Hagman, as called out in the mm -hmm. Eastside business plan. Um, and then it, kind of what what's going on along here. So essentially, we have on this corner we have a almost two thousand square foot uh, retail space, and then connected to that retail space is a um, outdoor seating area, with the assumption that if there were a cafe or restaurant, that mm -hmm. you would have outdoor seating here. Um, along here is a dedicated dedicated class two uh, bike parking. Um, so anyone who's coming to either the retail spaces can. Can park here. That's generally made for the public um, that are coming to the site to be able to park there, lock up their bikes. In um, class, use like an outside U rack. You just lock correct. your bike too. There's no locking or anything. Correct. Class mm -hmm. one is an enclosed, yep. mainly for like residents to to store their bikes. Um, and then we have a, a lobby here um, with a, a mail room and and a elevator and a main lobby for the residents to access um, their their units. Um, as well as stairs, and then the uh, the newer, the new uh, re additional retail space that was conditioned. Okay, that's helpful to me. Thanks for leading it through. Did you talk with the applicant about additional street trees? It's always hard, harder than it seems to add them. But were there any? Well, there are additional street that? trees along that are going to be along Hagman. Oh, it's yeah, going to be a minimum of three so along here, so it'll kind of match up with the three that are along SoCal. Okay. Were there any discussions about additional street trees on SoCal? Um, we didn't. That didn't come up, actually. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of conflict around street trees, I understand, but I just thought I'd ask that question. Last question, and I'm kind of cheating because years ago I worked on a project across the street. If I remember pulling that corner back and giving the city land helps, like, align SoCal better for cars and bikes a tiny bit, is that kind of the master plan for that yeah corner? I might call Curtis up here he kind of you know being public works that's kind of more his realm but yeah um, that part of SoCal is weird it like the lane shift and it right you know, we laid out our town on cow trails so, so. They're, it's, they're trying to improve that situation yeah so on this project on Hageman as you approach SoCal we did move the curb line in board at an angle to line up the intersection better with Trevithan there we go uh, yeah so mm -hmm. we did do that uh, on other projects that are pending, we've asked for dedications for realignment as you get down toward Frederick Street and mm -hmm. those areas, but there was no realignment on SoCal there. Okay, but this project's given a little bit of land to, to help that long Correct, yeah, well, the signal will move in, everything will move in. Actually, the bike lane acceptance on SoCal will have a bigger throat okay. to get into because the existing curb line kind of bulbs out almost on the corner there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a 90 degree angle. Because there was that fatality not too long ago, so every little bit helps here. Uh, public, thank you. Yeah, public works is actively looking at these bike lanes to do something in the you know big picture in the future. Yeah, I know you are. I just want to make sure everyone hears it too. Mm -hmm. All right, Commissioner Conway. All right. Um, 
So I was also glad to see the additional um, commercial space. What type of um, business would be viable in that much space? Yeah, we had some discussions with the applicant. I mean, they were a little hesitant about about mm -hmm. the retail space and whether it would be viable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities um, in terms of what be a small retail business starting out, um, you know, anything from, uh, you know, like a small sandwich shop, small um, uh, cafe, uh, yogurt shop, something like that. I mean, there's, 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 it's a small space, but I think the talking with economic development over the years, you know, it's, it's good to have some small spaces for starting businesses, mm -hmm. you know, that start out small and kind of get their feet wet. And then assuming they're successful, they can move on to a larger space. So these kind of spaces are in demand. Okay. I guess I have one other question. Go right ahead. So um, I agree that this is a really important alley. Um, it's, you know, I could go on about all of the different reasons that it's such an important alley. And I didn't see any discussion about why it was decided to to retain it as two ways? Was there any discussion about making it one way? Did that just not work? Maybe it's a dumb idea. It just seemed like there's so much, and there has to be a lot of attention on safety in, back there. It, it, it never really came, I mean, we, when we were first looking at it, that came up as to, is it one way? Is it two way? What is it? Um, and so it was determined um, that from Public Works that it's, it's a two way alley. It's kind of a, I mean, most alleys in, in town are two-way. It, it, um, it wouldn't so. enhance safety and... Um, Get some water. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. That's, Can you please not talk over us? We also, you're not on the public record when you just shout things out, so just so you know. So the, the question on the alleyway, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have one-way alleys. Okay. okay. There might be some downtown with ballers in them, Things like that, but for the most part, they're, they're typically two ways. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wondered if it had been looked at, or, and that's a good reason. <laughs> yes, I did talk to it with traffic engineering. We went over it and looked at the pros and cons of it, and keeping it the way it was. Okay. Best. Thank you. And Commissioner Conway, I just mentioned also that for that, uh, Sam was mentioning that for that additional retail space, office is also allowed. So. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. State office or Realtor, have a small office insurance. Go in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more from Mike. Um, yeah, just really quickly. In, in my conversations with staff, we did talk about the, you know, whether or not that uh, alley was one way, and kind of what we had talked about was that if it was a one way going the way that things were initially planned, it would divert all that traffic onto Forest, and then anybody who was trying to turn left well, would be in a tough spot. And so with that left-hand turn lane on Hageman, um, people backing out of this development would have the option to turn onto Hageman and have that protected left, especially at you know, rush hour traffic hours. And so um, in my conversations with staff, that's, that was my understanding. All right. So I think it's time to hear from the applicant um, with your presentation. Welcome. Come on up. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Vince Sozankowski. I'm a partner at 1800 Soquel. Um, I'm here with, uh, I've got a partner, Xander, in the back there. Uh, you'll hear from Mark Donahue, our architect, and should you have any legal questions, uh, Darian from our law firm is here as well. Um, been developing for about 20 years. We've done a whole bunch of uh, off-base military housing, um, done a handful of projects around. All the partners are actually from the Bay Area, so not local, but not that far away. Um, we came into this project, it was a 32-unit uh, mixed development with a lot of surface parking, ultimately really did not address um, housing need. Um, from my particular point of view, uh, I really don't like surface parking. I think it continues what really looks like a used car lot. Um, we're obviously keenly aware of the housing crisis here, and we came in with what we thought was a solid solution that provided a lot of housing. Um, yes, we are asking for uh, some density bonus considerations, um, but I, I do want to point out 
particularly to the public, that we could have used other state laws and gone bigger and parked it less. Um, so, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the things that we have focused on is trying to put as much parking in there as possible. Yes, we're asking for a waiver on parking, um, but uh, as a recent example, you know, we were recently introduced the idea of, of additional uh, commercial, you know, that 1,000 square feet that we just, um, and uh, I was very adamant that I did not want to lose any parking spots by moving our bike parking into the garage. Um, ultimately, I, I think bike commuting is fantastic, but here in America, you know, lots of people have cars, even if you do commute by bike. So we've really focused on trying to do that. And in fact, yesterday, uh, the concept of turning those parking spots 90 degrees so that we could get another three parking spots, that's why we turned them, right? Because we wanted to be responsive um, as much as we could, at least, to the neighbors. Um, we focused on uh, affordable by design. Obviously, we have a component of uh, what is required to be low and very low income. But we've also tried to design something um, that is reasonably attainable um, given this market. Um, you know, a lot of the other things we've tried to do, we've tried to do this articulated tower so it's not just a massive. If you, if you look at the, uh, the view from the front, it does look like a massive structure. But obviously, there's different towers. There's kind of this village approach. We're trying to break it up a lot. Um, the access, which I know is a hot button here, um, we did, obviously we don't want to make it on SoCal because that's going to put uh, bike traffic in danger and I, I don't think we can probably. Um, so we, we've tried to minimize use of the alley as much as possible. I mean, obviously our entrance is right there um, so that residents coming in and out from the underground parking uh, won't be on the alley for any great distance. Um, obviously, we've dedicated the corner. That's going to make things safer. Um, and though I know there's a lot of people that will disagree with me, um, we have tried to make this a community asset and park it as much as possible and create as much safety and benefit for the community as possible. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Mark Donahue, our architect. All right. Questions for the applicant? Here from Mark. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, first, I'd just uh, for everyone's benefit, I think we all know the site and you've looked at the documents. But if we could go to the next slide, uh, one of the reasons that this is really an ideal location for housing is where it's located relative to the other goods and services, as well as. Uh, SoCal is a main artery. You can see the walk score is actually surprisingly high, 81, and uh, the biking score is very, very high at 93. And so you have this location where residents have access to the, all the amenities of the Seabright neighborhood, very close at hand. And next slide. Uh, particularly something that we do not often see is there are four grocery stores within a half mile of the site. Well, maybe I guess the Whole Foods is uh, just under a mile. But uh, there's a Walgreens next door. Um, the number of projects that we do where these kinds of residentially minded amenities appear is very small. <clears throat> I think the other thing that this map shows is that the uses to date have been primarily centered around cars. You've got several car dealerships, both used and new. There's a truck center that uh, I think now is going to also be developed as residential. But the neighborhood previously was really a car center. And so this is the first step in what is going to be a series of developments that change this to a pedestrian residential quarter. Next. <clears throat> Here's the site plan. I think we've talked over many of the issues. You can ignore the parking on this one. We didn't update this plan. But uh, let's go to the next slide. Next one. And so I, th I want to talk about a little bit about the way that we've masked this up. Uh, the street wall is on Soquel, which is the busier, uh, more active street. And that is, just from an urban design standpoint, typically what we do. We provide a street wall that addresses and defines the street. And then at the rear of the site, we have the smaller buildings that are facing the residential neighborhood. And we'll get into more detail later on that. Next. Uh, we've talked over a lot of the issues on the ground floor. 
Um, we are adding seven and a half feet to the alley within the footprint of our site. And uh, it is really, right now the alley is 15 feet wide, badly paved and two way. And so in the area where we have the parking, we really want to make it safer. How safe and to what degree we need to adapt further, we're happy to talk about. And you'll also notice that from the parking garage, there's left in and right out only, so that if you are somebody who's parked in the garage, that would be your customary way of getting in and out. Um, and so that would diminish the amount of traffic that would be on the alley. <clears throat> and furthermore, you can see that we've moved the parking entry all the way over uh, towards Hageman in the building. So we did have in mind the kind of safety issues, and we did our best to, to find a solution that maximized that safety. Um, the commercial viability, the space, the 900 square foot space, I think it's been addressed, but it could be uh, any number. Uh, we do a lot of retail work and we do a lot of shops this size that are exactly as described. There's startups, it's a barber shop, it is some kind of community serving function. Um, it could be a small retail venue like sandwiches or coffee, and those are exactly what they need something that's small enough to afford but is prominent enough to be successful along a major traffic lane. Next. Upstairs, you can see that we've divided it into four wings. The two in the front that face Soquel are kind of connected, but the ones in the back, that's intentionally meant to scale down towards the neighborhood. Uh, granted, uh, it's you know going from four story to three story. There are some townhomes that face the alley that are two and three stories tall, but uh, that is a typical urban infill strategy to go from something taller towards the street and then diminishing the mass as you go down. Next. And then just a typical upper, upper floor, you can see the separation between the different wings. And so one of the other things that we were striving for was a more contemporary expression. I know that uh, in when it comes to aesthetics, there's a lot of different preferences that abide. There's some people who prefer historic styles. Um, we felt that in this case, Given the nature of the neighborhood and the fact that in many ways it's very tired, uh, it's you know things built in the 60s that have not been maintained, that we would be better off doing a fresh contemporary expression, uh, colors that are more modern. And uh, so that was what we were striving for. We have the base, the podium base, which is really at a pedestrian scale. It's almost like a separate building. And then as you move up the building, all the windows uh, are layered in such a way as to provide human scale and understanding for somebody standing on the street that this is a building of a certain height. Um, next, those, uh, this is the back elevation and elevation facing our neighbor to the east. Next. And then here's a view, uh, aerial view from the neighborhood side. And you can see that uh, even though they may appear to be large masses, these are much smaller than if we were to put the long portion of the building facing the neighborhood. There's an open space on top of the podium that's seen in the center. And uh, that will be landscaped, but uh, the boundary of it will not be accessible, so people who are living there will not be standing at the edge peering into the alley. And finally, this is the, I think you've seen this view before. Last one. And then this is the view from across. Uh, I just learned uh, Trevison is the street. If you're on the corner of Trevison and Soquel, this is what you would see. All right, same. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, welcome your feedback. All right, I know we've got a few questions. Do other commissioners have questions? Commissioner McKelvey. Hi. Um, is the idea that this is going to be built with modular construction? It is possible point. to build this modularly. It's actually extremely efficient for modular construction. Um, of course, the prevailing benefit there would be the time of construction. Yes. I guess I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you really answered it, but this project is what, from what we've been seeing and what state law would say, say this is over parked I'm sorry it, it's over parked and um, parking is meaning you're providing more parking than you're required to provide I appreciated your explanation and I agree with it but um, parking is really expensive to build and um, so you're you're making a, it's a big decision 
um, there to make that. And um, yeah, I guess I just I just wanted to um, state that I mean you're you're driven to do that because you believe that the um, the future renters are going to appreciate having both bike and car parking. I believe that's true. That um, we are still, despite our best interests, our car centric society. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get to your job, to uh, you know, to go out on trips on the weekend. The great thing about this parking, though, is that if in the future it is determined that that program is better utilized in some other way, it's relatively easy to convert. Um, the retail uh, frontage that we have now mm -hmm. is essentially a program that's been slotted into what was a parking garage. Okay. And uh, so that entire center portion, let's just say that the neighborhood really takes off, there's a huge demand for retail, mm -hmm. then we can look at converting it at a, at a later date. It's easy. Okay. I have one other question um, about the parking, and um, it's a question that we see as, as we see these um, you know, more dense developments. Where does the Amazon truck stop? Great question. Um, uh, I have this question too. Can we go back to that first floor plan and you want to do uh, dumpsters while we're there? Okay. So on the first floor, you see that the trash room is located on Hageman. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is that the one of those parking spaces would be transitory use for uh, trash day. Okay. Um, and especially if even the two-hour parking were to wrap around the corner, uh, that would be a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. um, you can just reserve that space. Uh, to be honest, the delivery part of it, we probably need to give more thought, and we would look for some feedback. The garage is tall enough for panel trucks to come inside, mm -hmm. but we don't really have a location for them to stop. These days, the, a lot of times, if you have a loading zone in front, that is where FedEx, UPS, et cetera, will park and deliver into the lobby or into the retail. Which would be on Soquel. On Soquel. And maybe in those two hour spaces. So it's gonna be like it is in every other neighborhood. But that's Precisely. such a busy corridor that. Uh, every busy corridor. Um, if you look at the local businesses, you'll see there's not a lot of loading facilities separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there access control both at the lobby and at the gate for the entry to the parking? Yes, there would be. So even if there was, if a truck pulled up in the back, they can't get into the parking lot because they'd want to go over to the lobby. And uh, they're not going to be able to get in from, from there without some kind of access token or something. Uh, yes. And so... We're pretty much, it seems like we're pretty much looking at, you know, if they want access to the, either the mail drop or access to the units, it seems like it's pretty much a given that they're going to be parking out on Soquel. Does that make sense? I'm just. I was, I mean, when I, when you brought up that question, my initial thought would be parking somewhere along that Hagman frontage. Cause there actually is no parking allowed along Soquel Avenue, right? So that's, right. Yeah. right, and so, so and so, is there even access to the building uh, for a mail drop or anything on Hageman? It's it's for the, if you're dropping something for a resident, mm -hmm. the entry is over on Soquel. Mm -hmm. So that means they'd have to stop on Hageman somewhere, or probably park in I don't know Walgreens or something, and then walk around all the way around that corner and try to drop something. So. This is a good question. And Mark, I appreciate the challenge with the specific feedback when you're going to mm -hmm. shift things around too. Mm -hmm. um, there's always competing curb space and alley space, so it's a juggling act. John, I don't know if this would apply, but I work in a very small office building, mm -hmm. but the Amazon person just has the code and okay. the, the post office person has the code and they pull right out. Yeah, the post kind office of always does. Deal, but yeah. That's what we've worked out because mm -hmm. there's a lot of deliveries and, yeah. you know, it kind of applies in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, uh, more questions? Yeah. Just one quick one. Um, I guess I'm just curious where you envision uh, parking for the commercial, you know, frequenting a commercial space is going to go. Um, I know, and, you know, obviously the ones in the back are a good possibility. Along Hageman is a good possibility. But in terms of, you know, having a, a parking garage that is accessible only by residents, you're having somewhat dedicated parking. 
and then the rest seems to be fairly, you know, kind of a free for all. And is that kind of how you see it? Or? Yeah, I should clarify that um, there's a lot of ways to divide up the parking. The security points of entry can be defined by a fence uh, with an operable gate, and so you can have things that are on the boundary line that is that are accessible to the public without. Uh, compromising the spaces that uh, where you have parking um, you know those are really great considerations and uh, we'll further take those thoughts and develop them thank you all right I've got a couple questions uh, so street trees are hard did you guys ever think about adding street trees on Soquel you know, I know there's underground stuff and public works and transformers and yada yada, but I want, like, if we don't condition five out there, we might never get four. So what are your thoughts on uh, conditioning two extra street trees on SoCal? So uh, the primary challenge is actually all the things that are already there. The utility lines, the uh, lampposts, you have to maintain a certain distance from the lampposts, uh, the traffic signal pole, all of those things occupy a footprint along the, the frontage. Um, for my part, I would love to see more trees if we can find a spot where they can land because it's just gonna make the building nicer, it's gonna make the street nicer. Mm -hmm. When we were looking at it though, uh, it's all those challenges you're talking about, utility, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like uh, faults yeah. and the like. Um, like I said, I've never seen street trees added between this stage and construction docks, so. You know, that's why I kind of been tempted to ask for a bit more there, understanding it would be a difficult, difficult challenge. So I don't want to get into my comments, but the plan for this area, in my mind, is 50 years from now. Beautiful sidewalks with trees, beautiful stores along thriving businesses of all sizes. So in the interest of that vision, not that your project's going to give that to us, but at least for your little part, could you describe how adding that commercial is going to make that elevation in particular, you know, closer to our dream of this magical street, you know, that we all have together, including you guys? Um, like so, maybe the elevation we could put up? And again, yeah. I'm sorry, because I'm asking you to design like on the spot, but that's all right. would um, it look more like the main corner or maybe just verbally describe it? So I guess the first thing to point out is that uh, this change to the retail program on the east side of the building is uh, happening today, uh, happened this, uh, prior to this meeting. So we haven't had a chance to go back into the elevation and make it feel like a retail venue. Uh, I think the primary advantage of having retail of any kind or commercial is just the sense of activity. You're walking by, there's people occupying, you see the lights on. Um, we particularly, are targeting that corner for a cafe. I know the client has had talks with a uh, potential uh, retail tenant, restaurant tenant mm -hmm. already, who would love to have that outdoor space for a little uh, garden. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't had a chance to approach anyone on a smaller space, but we do a lot of retail, and those types of uses are actually fairly easy uh, for service type and uh, for small cafes that are serving uh, food that doesn't require grill or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a sandwich shop that's just serving sandwiches and uh, it's not serving hot food uh, mm -hmm. or is, you know, microwave hot. Uh, and also, uh, like a yogurt or a cafe, I mean, uh, okay. it's amazing to me how insatiable we are for coffee. And whether there was ever a tenant there or not, it would provide some more transparency to that corner. That's right. Though probably storefront, which is not like, we'll like our vision down. of clear glass, but, you know, some more windows, some more stuff down there. Because my main concern was like that, uh, shared with staff, that really long space with really no active anything going on. Okay. Um, one more question. So, like... Um, I work in uh, clean energy. You know, we worked on A31 water together. But the pressure in this type of building on all those spaces that we just talked about, the service spaces, and then now all the heat pump water heaters and, you know, all this other stuff is huge. You have the ability to delete parking at will, is my understanding. Like, you could do a no parking project if you wanted. 
if we relieve the bike condition, would that give you some more square footage for something else? That would be useful. I see you're taking it down from whatever, 85 to 73. And it feels weird to ask for that, but you know, if we could free up some room for something more useful, would that help? That is a very loaded question. Because the yes. uh, <laughs> first part of it is, what do you mean by useful? Ah. Um, and then the second part of it is that right now we've got the, the resident parking is on the second floor. So you'd have to take your bike into the elevator. Mm -hmm. um, not typically ideal, but workable if you have nice durable finishes in the elevators. It's very close to the front door, just up a floor. Um, but that space doesn't really lend itself to any of these other functions that we are looking at. I see. Um, the, the, between the cafe and the lobby, that span is very shallow. I mean, it fits parking for bikes. Um, and it's impossible to have a retail that would function in that space. Um, so that, that's more part of the 50-year deal, mm -hmm. where you eliminate the parking and you can get that 30, 40 foot depth. Um, and just, just a side note, there is one class, one parking space out there. We have a, a locker. So somebody can take their $5,000 bike and lock it up. OK. That's enough. And that was a loaded question. Thank right. you for calling me out on that. Last one is, this project applied before the objective standards. Is that my it did. understanding? OK. So that's good. The things that we're going to work on together tonight are things we all want to do by consensus and not by force or us telling you what to do it. Because I think we all have a strong interest in this neighborhood thriving, Absolutely. both in the next 10 years and the next 50. So I look forward to this discussion. And uh, let's figure out what we can do that will come as close as possible to make everyone happy. That was kind of comments. OK. I have, I have one more question, yep. if I can. Um, the lighting in the alley was mentioned. Yes. Do you have? Uh, scheme in mind for that, just in terms of the impact on any of the neighbors as far as shielding or dark sky concerns or anything that, uh, is it attached to the building? Is it mounted in the alley? Can you describe oh, that a little um, bit? I'm so glad you brought that up because I personally uh, am, I find uh, uplighting abhorrent, mm -hmm. uh, just personally. I think it's, um, it's just like uh, really turning our backs on, on a very important resource, which is to see mm -hmm. the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So we always, on our projects, shield the lighting. And we do the cutoffs so that they don't extend past the property line. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that there's not going to be reflected or diffused light that makes its way? No. But we do everything within our power not to light the structure, but to light where the people are. Mm -hmm. um, first thing is, is that if you have a glare source, and so an unexposed luminaire, <clears throat> it just is less safe because you can't read people's faces. You can't see their uh, what's on their mind, and so we always avoid that. But also, there's no reason to light the building. Um, you know, people's windows will be lit, and so there will be that warm glow. And if you want to see what the building looks like, come during the day. Uh, so we will keep everything low and shielded, and just meet the minimum code requirement for exiting. And do you have you? Is it building mounted? Is it on yes. a standard? Is it, it would be building mounted, and it would be just above the first level. So it's not like way up on the building, and it's definitely not on standards out in the alley. Is there any chance? It, I don't know if there are guidelines that the staff have communicated, but is there a chance that it could be lower than, you know, coming from above the first floor? It just I'm just thinking about the illumination that is inevitably going to happen on those walls. They're quite tall on that bottom floor. We would absolutely be open to that. It's, I'm not creating another condition. I'm just wondering what your proposal was. Um, you know, it, at this point, we have uh, more of a diagrammatic approach to the lighting. So we will definitely take that into account and uh, applaud that sentiment. I'll, I'll just mention that there is a standard condition about yeah. um, lighting and it being screened and um, make sure it's downward and not outward. and. It stays on the property, shielded. And it's usually cheaper to do it that way, which is fantastic. All of the above. Less energy needed to do the same job. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Good, so now I'd like to just take a deep bre breath and get ready to hear from the public. Uh, we're extremely happy you all are here. Thank you, sincerely. I'm not just saying that. Uh, I live on the west side. I don't know your neighborhood as well as you do. Um, that being said, public comment can go on and on and on. So one popular thing to do is the speaker can say, can I get a show of hands for everyone who's into that? You know, maybe once or twice and don't get out of control, but then everyone can express how they feel without necessarily coming up and saying the same thing over and over again. Um, we have allowed a special request uh, to give a 10 minute time limit to uh, come on up, introduce yourself. Thank you so much for having our group. Great. And let me just finish. Uh, the, yes. the, the timer is just to mm -hmm. keep things going, keep these meetings going for, forever. So in the meantime, if anyone else wants to add, please come on up over here on the left. And if you want to, you can put your name down. And if you just queue up a few minutes ahead of time, that keeps us moving. Again, the 10 minutes is not so I can cut you off at 10 minutes, but to keep us from going for half an hour. I, I, I so, think it'll um, be OK. Good. All right, go. <laughs> OK. Um, so again, thank you for having us. And we really appreciate the extra time to speak with you. My name is Rena Dubin, and I'm here representing the group Concerned Neighbors of Hageman. Some of the neighbors in our group are against this project in its entirety, believing that the scale is too big for this area of our city. Other neighbors, like myself, are generally positive about the addition of rental housing in Santa Cruz. I personally have spent thousands of volunteer hours advocating for more affordable housing projects downtown. But what we all agree on, all the neighbors in our group, no matter our other politics, is that this project, as it has been presented to you, is dangerous. It will increase collisions. These plans will not work in the real world, and we are alarmed about the safety and livability of our street. We ask that you delay approving this project until our concerns have been addressed. This is fixable. As one neighbor states, all the residents here are asking is for a better solution, which in reality is a more sustainable solution for all of us involved. There is a better way. Our group is composed of neighbors on Hageman, Hageman Court, and Forest Avenue. Many of us came to the community meeting and commented on the absurdity of the plans and how dangerous it will be. We thought that they changed the plans based on our feedback. We were really naive, and we didn't realize until about two weeks ago that the only difference to the plan is the inclusion of an extra parking space. Our streets, Forest and Hageman, are unique. It's a horseshoe with a cul-de-sac. As one neighbor says, the Planning Commission must understand Forest and Hageman. Everyone who lives here has to get onto Soquel Avenue. It's super busy to go anywhere. Unlike most small neighborhood streets that have multiple ways to get in and out, we only have one cross street, and that's Soquel. Next slide. We are dependent on the alley and the light at the intersection of Hageman and Soquel to be able to get in and out of our homes. Whenever there is road work on Soquel, for instance, like maybe putting a pipe carrying water from Santa Cruz to Soquel Creek Water District, we can't leave our streets without the alley and the light. If PG&E is doing any kind of upgrade, or there's an accident, or road work, or even just an extra tremendous amount of traffic, we can't leave without the alley and the light. As one neighbor states, if this proposal is approved, when and if a future fire or earthquake were to occur, I foresee unnecessary tragedies. This project, as it stands now, commandeers the public alley that is crucial for our streets. A neighbor calls it an important traffic corridor that mitigates some of the worst traffic in the neighborhood. But this development uses the alley as its own private driveway and makes the light at Hageman and Soquel impossible to use. And I say that even after seeing what they have come up with today, I still stand by all of my comments here. They could have easily fixed this by making the egress on Soquel. Let me walk you through this. We'll start with the alleyway. Here's the alleyway. It's one lane alley, but traffic goes in both directions. It's 15 feet wide, which is big enough for one fire truck, but not wide enough for two cars to pass each other. 
Here's how one neighbor describes the alley. I live at 178 Hageman Avenue and ride my bike down the alleyway twice a day with my child on the bike. I have used the alley every day for 10 years, and it is our neighborhood's outlet to Arana Gulch. Almost every time I ride, I see people riding their bike or walking their dog or pushing their kid in a stroller, as many people use this alleyway. Whenever a car comes while pedestrians or bikers are in the alley, the car has to pull over to make room as it is too tight. Another neighbor says, presently, we are all able to travel back and forth down that alley with several spots to pull over, which allows a polite neighborly flow of bicycles, walkers, dogs, and cars. There are about 90 homes on our two streets. The one-lane, two-way traffic works because there are only 90 houses. This development is 84 units. This is, in effect, doubling the amount of traffic on the alleyway. The one-lane alley can't handle doubling traffic. One neighbor says this plan is going to create a major dangerous thoroughway adjacent to what is already a very dangerous intersection. This proposal is so ludicrous that it doesn't even work for the development. So look, so this is the slide. You've got people leaving the development going one way and people coming in the alleyway to get into the development coming the other way. How are they expected not to bump into each other? Where do they go if someone is coming out the other way? Are they supposed to back up? What if a car is coming in from forest? What about the cars parked outside? So you have all those cars that are now going to be backing out into the alleyway. The developer's traffic study in your packet says that there will be an additional 409 trips per day. That's 409 chances for a collision per day. And then we get to the intersection on Hageman and Soquel. So the next slide, please. If we need to go towards Morrissey, we need to make a left at the light. Most of the times, most times of the day, we can't cross Soquel without the light at Hageman allowing us to make a left turn. This is true for anyone on a bike as well. It's a dangerous intersection. You have neighbors from Forest and Hageman needing to make a left. Next. You have the Walgreens exit for people making a left back onto Soquel. Next. You have this very wonky intersection at Trevithin that is at an angle and difficult to see, and I appreciate that there might be some mitigation, but I still think it's going to be very wonky. Uh, next. You also have pedestrians crossing. As one neighbor says, I have had cars honk at me and almost hit me many times. Um, next. We also have a new development coming in here on 162 Hageman, and that's going to have a minimum of 21 cars, but it's going to likely be more. It's townhomes with ADUs. So you need to consider the impacts of these two developments together. The development at 162 Hageman will dramatically increase the number of cars at this light. Next. And you have this project with 409 trips. The light on Hageman is long, and even if there's a protected left, which is great, it's still going to be very long. The traffic study says that during peak hour, we can expect 35 new car trips. If half of those are going to the light at Hageman to go straight or make a left turn, then it will, as one neighbor explains, back up the Hageman light. It will likely back up the car traffic enough that it blocks the alleyway. Next. According to the developer's own aerial photo in the packet, it looks like it'll only take about 10 cars until the alleyway is blocked. Then what happens? The existing neighbors can't leave, the people who live in the development can't leave, and we are all, in effect, trapped. Next slide. According to one neighbor, the alley and the intersection will never safely accommodate this project. We know much of this can be averted. You can make Soquel the access point and not the alley. Um, go back. This slide. There we are. And this here again is the developer's own photo. And 
We just want you to see how all the parking spots along the street are taken. <laughs> They're already used. The street parking is already full in this just random photo that was from Google Maps or wherever. As a neighbor says, the community already is impacted by, by more vehicles than places to put them. Another resident adds, we know you are constrained by the state in regards to parking, but the situation is already untenable. It is unrealistic to believe that the number of parking spaces provided in this design will come anywhere close to accommodating the number of cars that residents of this building will bring with them. Additionally, a neighbor states, we already have no parking on the street. I never get to park in front of my house at 161 Hageman. I have to park down the block and walk back with my groceries and parcels. There are solutions, creative solutions to parking. I know some cities are rethinking parking lots like Walgreens and doing creative 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, partnerships with businesses and residents. Some neighbors here want permit parking for only the existing residents. Some don't like permit parking, but we all agree the time to mitigate is right now. I'm almost done. Go ahead, finish your thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. This development has an outsized impact on our little horseshoe street. If these exact plans are approved, there will be more accidents. A cyclist already died at this corner. Please insist that the entrance to this development is on Soquel and keep them from overloading the alleyway and our intersection. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so who here agrees with that statement? <laughs> I thought so, I just wanted to get on the record. Um, Thanks, and that was a good applause round, but let's keep it to a minimum, please, as others speak. No booing, please. Come on up. Oh. Sorry. No, that's fine. Stand in line. Uh, so we'll give <laughs> one minute for public comment. Um, I live on Mentel Avenue, which horseshoes around to Park Avenue and goes along Arana Gulch. I understand we need more affordable housing for our residents in Santa Cruz, and I support that. The 1800 Soquel Avenue development consists of 14 low-income and 70 market-rate rentals. How will 70 market-rate rentals help our community? It will not help our teachers and locals who work at the grocery stores, the restaurants, and the small business employees. I'd also like to know the long-range plan for transportation in the city of Santa Cruz. And has a current traffic impact study been performed on Soquel Avenue? The Water Street Grants of 45 story building has not been constructed yet, but it's in the mix, right? Um, adding 84 units on Soquel Avenue in addition to that housing development will have severe consequences on traffic and impact the safety of our neighborhoods. It will, the extra vehicles from both of those projects. So just finish your thought, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll cut off access for the Midtown residents needing to get to urgent care at the hospital or out of our neighborhood if a fire occurs, especially our neighborhood that's also adjacent to Rana Gulch, and we've had fires out there before. This area of Santa Cruz can't accommodate all of this additional housing, specifically both of these projects and developments. SoCal Avenue is unable to meet the needs of the public that reside in the neighborhoods as it is now. The site of this development will only impact this area further. And my neighborhood is an island with only SoCal Avenue available as, to us to get in and out of our neighborhood. Okay, the last, last sentence, please. Um, I've spoken to Carmel, Pacific Grove, and Monterey. And I think we all need to work together and discuss with the state how we can work together because I know this whole density bonus permit is working and your hands are tied, but it doesn't work in these small communities and we have no infrastructure to, to house all these people with our roads, especially SoCal Avenue. Okay, thank you.
Good evening, commissioners and staff. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. My name is Larry Wolfson. I'm a 60-year resident of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, and you have before you a letter that I wrote. Uh, it's in your packets. My family and I own the adjoining property. Uh, get a sign up anyhow that 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 uh, the adjoining property. We have the one along Soquel there. Was that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Just to, the, just to the east. Oak Hill and backs up against the alley. Got it. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, my family and I have had a number of concerns which we've discussed and decided we can live with, uh, boiling it down to just two that we really want your consideration on and, and support. One has already been mentioned, which was the parking in front of the uh, retail uh, establishment that was put in when it, when it was required. Uh, maybe just uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., keep that available, and uh, during the night it could be used then for other parking. The second one is a little more complex, and that's the alley. Uh, that alley is basically one way. When a car enters from one end, if a car enters from the other, one of them has to back up. It's used primarily by uh, strollers, houses, walking people, people walking uh, back and forth. The concern is with the addition of the access to the parking, that that alley will become used fairly regularly and often. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And we ask that if that is the case, the developer and subsequent landowners be required to maintain it because that is, the way it is now, it requires little maintenance, unfortunately, uh, but uh, it does work. But if you get more traffic on that alley, it just isn't going to work, uh, and it should be the responsibility of those creating that traffic to, to take care of it. Thank you for your time. I am available to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Thanks for coming up. Letters in your packets. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, commissioners. Thank you for hearing all of us. Um, I will keep my comments short, as many of them are repetitive. I'm aware of that. Um, but it is a huge concern, as you can tell, from all of our people here who took time out of their lives and so forth to sit through a very long presentation. And we now have a very short amount of time to um, express our feelings and our thoughts and our concerns. Um, I was quite... Uh, dismayed, uh, Mr. Kennedy, to hear you say that you have a, a vision for our neighborhood, but you live on the west side, not in our neighborhood, so it's a little bit, uh, as we say in my tradition, chutzpah. Got a bit to, of this feedback during the corridor planning process, too. But, okay, uh, well, um, many of us, I, I would be happy to ask for a show of hands if we wanted to, many of us have lived in this neighborhood for 20, 30, 40, and more years. More of, most of us own property. It is our neighborhood. And this is not our vision for our neighborhood at all. I hope it's very clear. I understand that to some extent your hands are, quote, tied. But I think there are many ways, as the person before me said, that we can work something out. First of all, this project is enormous for the size of our neighborhood. I think that's been made very clear. There is nothing else anywhere near that is that height near our specific area. So it would be a complete exception to that. It would change the nature of the neighborhood significantly, OK? I hope that's very clear to you all. We are unhappy with that. It's not that we're against providing housing. We, all of us are concerned. I ride my bike almost every day and have done so with my two children who've grown up in the neighborhood. It is not a safe neighborhood to ride a bike on. Cars are driving by on Soquel at 50 and 60 miles per hour on a regular basis. The bike lane is extremely limited. I know that's not our concern here at the moment, but everybody has spoken about the danger to all these added. I want to say one more thing and then I'll give my space up. And that is that these units 
are 432 square feet. Some of them are bigger, I agree. Now, if I had a tape measure, I'd be more than happy to walk along and say, this is how big this space is. It's probably about, about the size of this space. Of the D is here, yeah. Okay, so we are talking about quite small spaces. Now, I would love to ask the developer and his, and his other, you know, and the architect, if they have children who are grown young children, one more thought and then wrap it up, please. Yes. And how much money those children are able to make. And if those children would want to live in these little homes. Because I work with people who are UCSC students who are making minimum wage. If you're making minimum wage and you're working 40 hours a week, you're making slightly more than $2,000 a month. These are going to be homes that are going to be market rate. We all know the chances are high that there will be more than one person living in these units to pay for the market rate rent. Therefore, there will be even more cars than are currently being imagined, okay? I want that to be clear to all of you. That is not, it's not gonna be 84 cars. It's gonna be over 100 cars, right. At the risk easily. of more conflict, wrap it up, please. I'm, I'm finished, thank, thank you very you. much. Good evening, Commission and staff. Thank you for having me. I wasn't planning on showing up, but I opened the live stream and saw it was still going at 8 o'clock, so I thought this was very exciting. Uh, my name is Ryan Meckel. I'm a lead with Santa Cruz EMB. Uh, we are fully in support of this project and very much would like to see it move forward, as are our members. Um, I'd like to speak personally to this project, especially with the comment prior to mine, uh, how this would impact me. I've lived in Santa Cruz for the past six years. I rent and work at the university. I would love to have 435 square feet of space to live in. Currently, I share a thousand with two students at UCSC. I haven't been a student for the past two years, and I'd like to move into a space of my own. I'm not gonna own a home anytime soon with the prices, but I could rent a studio or one bedroom apartment, maybe. I would really, I would really like to see this project move forward because there are not enough options for people like me in Santa Cruz. I don't see many people that look like me here in this room right now, and I think that's a voice that isn't being heard. There are a lot of people that will live in this project that are currently sharing a room with maybe two to three other people because there simply aren't options in Santa Cruz. This is a project that would give people like me options to continue to work and live in Santa Cruz. Please move it forward. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. I live at 170 Hageman. I've lived there for over 30 years. And I, uh, I agree with um, pretty much the sentiments of some of the other neighbors in the area. Uh, I understand that, you're, uh, that there is, you know, your hands are tied. There is going to be a development at this, at this location. I'm actually happy to see a lot of units being built and would really appreciate if they were all affordable units because that's uh, what uh, the people of Santa Cruz need um, rather than um, making uh, money for uh, developers. So here's a, just a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, one of the commissioners, Commissioner Conway, mentioned where's the Amazon truck going to stop? Well, how about the mail truck? The mail carrier is going to be stopping there in front of the entrance every single day. Um, uh, right now, right now, there's parking. The parking for retail is in the back off the alley. Where is the retail parking going to be? Um, uh, if there's so much going on in the alley. I think we need a sidewalk in the alley, so with all the cars backing up, that there's a place for the pedestrians, which are don't want to have to dodge cars. Um, how about, um, uh, I appreciate the parking that's been put in there, but how about bus passes for all the residents? And that might reduce some of the, some of the uh, parking and traffic. And uh, in all the, drawings I saw, I did not see solar panels on the roof. Are there going to be solar panels? Thank you. Solar panels are mandatory for a building like this these days. Hi, I live at 144 Mentel Avenue, which is the horseshoe right next to this horseshoe. So I echo what everyone says about being stuck 
with SoCal as our only outlet and just how absolutely huge of a burden this is going to be on us and our neighborhoods. And I just, the, I'm pro housing. I'm pro building this in, you know, the original plan was 35 units. That's super reasonable for a neighborhood our size. This is absurdly dense. This is going to ruin and destroy our neighborhoods. With all due respect, we like our neighborhood. And I understand we have to build, but that vision that you put out sounds like a traffic nightmare. I mean, that's going to be, it's going to destroy our neighborhood. We're not trying to turn into a small San Jose. So please just be humble and realize that your vision may not be the vision that everyone shares and that we all actually have different visions and it's our neighborhood. Um, this is selling to the highest bidder. I mean, this is not what is best for our children. This is not what is best for the neighbors. This is not what is best for our community. Most of what I really wanted to say has already been said though, so that's all. Um, I thought it was really interesting in the, draw in the um, architectural drawings that you had of the building. Um, there was no traffic on SoCal. It was just, it was blank, and that is not There's the like truth. like 10 trees, too, if you know. Yeah, exactly, like a little forest. Um, um, but I think the big problem for me is the layout of the city. I mean, as everybody knows, um, there's a traffic funnel that comes in at Frederick Street because you've got Water Street, Broadway, and SoCal all funneling in to Frederick Street. There is always traffic there um, uh, at um, rush hour. Um, it extends not only there, but for anybody that has tried to drive east from Santa Cruz to Live Oak to Capitola, it's like a parking lot starting at about 3 o'clock. How is adding 84 units going to make that better? Um, <sighs> yeah, we're just going to have more traffic, more pollution. I also agree that there does need to be housing. I think this, I, I, I think this is just a, dis a recipe for disaster to add this much housing in this particular place. And I agree with what I've heard from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, much of this has already been said. Uh, Hagman is a cul-de-sac that is connected to Forest Avenue in a horseshoe. It's got 90 homes in it, and the through street is SoCal. During most times of the day, turning left is impossible. Without the protected light at Hagman, instead of putting the egress on the proposed development on SoCal, this development of 84 units doubles the traffic and needlessly complicates our limited traffic options. The alley and the intersection cannot safely accommodate this impact. The alleyway is a one-lane road used for two-way traffic. Uh, you know, I've, we've seen tonight you make a lot of effort to accommodate a back row of parking. I didn't see any ideas like make the whole lane, two-lane alleyway back there with two-way traffic. And why, why prioritize the back row of parking? Uh, if, you're, if you're not going to even consider egress through Soquel, you need to really reduce this impact. We've seen all the ways that this impact is gonna go sideways. The plan eliminates the room to pull over when a car is coming, a, coming the opposite direction. It doubles the two-way traffic. There'll be decreased visibility for cars turning into the alleyway and also Hageman, making the area dangerous for cars, pedestrians, and cyclists. We spoke of the tragic death on the corner of Soquel and Hageman. This project will increase the likelihood of future accidents, which are preventable with better planning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello. My name is Levi Glatt. I'm 22 years old, and I live on Forest Avenue. And I ride my, my bike to work every day through this area. And I fully support the addition of small rental units at this multi-use parcel. However, I, I have very strong concerns about the neighborhood impact of increased cars and vehicles in the alleyway and Hageman intersections. The current plan significantly changes traffic patterns in the neighborhood streets and will be dangerous for everyone involved, increasing the likelihood of collisions. 
I urge you to postpone approval until the project is safe for multi-use functionality for bicycles, pedestrians, and accommodation of vehicles. I will be in support of this plan eventually, but I feel strongly that this project should not get approved tonight. I urge the Planning Commission to only approve 1800 SoCal until after the entrance is modified from the alleyway to SoCal, or if you can find a option that accommodates everyone in order to reconsider community safety concerns. Thank you for your time. Hi. Um, my husband and I are like, fortunate enough to own a house on Forest Avenue. I say fortunate because it's a beautiful neighborhood, yes, but also I mean fortunate because we have generational wealth that allowed us to consider purchasing a house in Santa Cruz in the current market. I have seen too many of my peers, educated, engaged community members, move away from Santa Cruz because they couldn't afford to build their lives in this housing market. I know more who are considering doing so. These are not people who need options significantly below the market rate. These are individuals who just need more options. More options that will bring rent down costs just a little. Options that will make this market more competitive so that landlords cannot get away with being slumlords. We need more housing options. One definition of a crisis is a time when difficult and important decisions need to be made. We are in the middle of a housing crisis and the decisions that need to be made to get us out of it will be difficult for everyone. I encourage everyone to consider how we can be part of the solution that is best for the future of our whole community. I am especially passionate about the future of our community now that I have two young sons, two and a half years and two and a half months respectively. I feel so lucky they will I feel so lucky to be able to raise them in beautiful Santa Cruz, but I wonder what Santa Cruz will be like for them. I want them to grow up in a city that is working through this crisis, making an important and sometimes difficult decisions necessary to create space for those who want to live here. So I am here with all of you with an open mind to learn more about this development. I plan to stay actively and collaboratively engaged, and I'm grateful to everyone who is participating in these discussions. Building an apartment complex at 1800 SoCal Avenue would provide more housing options that this community desperately needs. I hope we can work together to welcome more neighbors to our special corner of Santa Cruz in the near future. Thank you. Good evening, my name's Deborah Bone. I've lived on Hageman Avenue for more than 30 years, and I'm not gonna repeat all my concerns about traffic because those are well articulated already. Um, I put a letter in the packet. You can read my suggestions. I'm grateful that the one that I said about the angles of parking was maybe listened to because that was, I think, better that the 90 degree angle has been changed. And I really honor all of you for thinking this through. Um, it's not an easy, match to do. Um, really, what we want is that you don't just, quote, follow the letter of the law, but actually take all of our concerns and use this as an opportunity to find the balance between building more housing and yet protecting our neighborhood streets and our alley. And it's not an easy solution, but we believe that with more thought, maybe it could work. I think part of the more thinking is that the developers might be asked to concede a little bit more territory on Hageman and SoCal so that there is room for a little bit more develop delivery trucks, bigger bike lane, better left turn tra traffic, figure that corner out that's such a mess with Trevithan so that just that actual intersection can be more functional. Um, the other question that I think is certainly on my mind and others here is, how is this development going to be managed? Is this going to be only a rental property? Are these units each going to be sold separately? Can flexible density units even be sold individually? Or is it going to be like under one housing authority? Um, are there going to be absentee landlords that each can buy one or can invest in them as a speculative real estate? Is there going to be any kind of rent considerations for those market value that they can't go up more than a certain percent each time that a new person leaves? I suspect there will be high turnover in such tiny little units. People will come until they can get settled, and then they'll look for something a little bigger. Can we make it a little bit closer to a model where, 
I know with the very low income and the low incomes, there's considerations. You can't just keep raising the rent. So maybe there needs to be something like that for something as small as this. Maybe the city needs to really think through how do we protect the longer range so that it doesn't just be a speculative real estate investment. And for those of us who live in the neighborhood, absentee landlords and separate people who no one person is in charge or in control is a recipe for disaster. So one, one more statement. These are great questions, and staff can answer most of them, yeah. too, okay. after the meeting. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I, I'm, I'm honoring your questions, but th th there's answers out good, there. Good, yeah. good. Because what's the responsibility that the city has to assure that this large complex of very small units will have uniform oversight with such a large population of residents? All these tiny units may be some kind of a contractual limit to how quickly the rents go up. And, and maybe, not, I don't know. I don't know how it works, but I just think, and then the other question that we all have is, what are the restrictions and the conditions of approval around the construction itself? The alley needs to be kept open. No, no big d trucks dropping off materials so that we can't use the alley. And there really shouldn't be construction noise between 8 AM and it'd be, Early than, earlier than 8 in the morning or 6 in the afternoon. I don't know when you do it. I know the city allows construction to go on till 10 p.m. I think that would be horrible. The city's plenty loud already. Anyway, so those are the kinds of um, considerations for us that are going to be living with whatever final plan there is. Okay, and, can you um, wrap it up, anyway, please? Yeah, that's it. Thank Thanks. you. Just to answer that quick question, it, it's this is a rental um, project. Um, they won't be owned individually like condos. They'll be, oh, uh, it'll be under, under one, one under one management. Yeah. Right. So, thank you so much for your time, the council. I, I just am filled with a tremendous sense of awe for the strength of our democracy that we're able to actually sit here like human beings and, and actually have this dialogue. And I just really want to say thank you so much for taking your time to be here to, to, to do this service for our community. So I am, with along with my wife, the homeowners at 251 Forest Avenue. We are the only house that uses the easement to access our parking. Our parking is in the alley, our driveway. That's right, that's right. Our, our garage is in the alley. The only access to our garage is in the alley. Um, I know the gentleman who spoke earlier who owns the unused fallow warehouse space across the street. It has been fallow for almost a decade now. I could go into detail about pricing and why that sits fallow, but that is the case. In any case, I want to share with you that I have a ring camera in that alley. And if you're interested in seeing what traffic patterns on that alley look like, I will give you access to that camera. You must know this. It's not only my 75-year-old quadriplegic neighbor and her pug. It's not only the neighbors on Hegeman who are raising small children in, on, with tricycles riding through those potholes that the city will not fix, even though the gentleman with the dreadlocks and I, several years ago, took his tamper and some cold patch and patched that alley. Because the people at your... I don't know what's going on with City Works, but that's what's going on in my neighborhood is that we are patching that alley ourselves. Uh, in any case, I also just finally, one last thing. There are enormous trucks. The liquids for the auto parts store, it's on their delivery route. They come down and knock the trees, knock the limbs off the trees weekly with their deliveries. This is not a standard small truck, gentlemen and ladies. This is a serious, heavy-duty, rear-dually monster truck. This is a delivery vehicle. And my understanding, and it's been my, my understanding since I bought the place five years ago, and I actually was born here in the Beach Flats in 1969, but the, what I see is that the plumbing supply company will stop and block that alley for 15, 20 minutes at a time to load and unload. And that's been the case for decades. That alley will get blocked for long stretches of time by industrial traffic, right? So this is all, and finally, let's be real about semantics. Semantics matter, especially with regard to law. And so what we're talking about here, this is not an alley. Don't, don't buy this. Oh, the alley, the alley. Guys, ladies, this is a thoroughfare. 
If you look back far enough into the records of this city, it is a named street called Forest Lane. We could call it Bike Boulevard, maybe. Bike, oh, and the other thing, every, everybody's so concerned about the bike lane on Soquel. Guys, the bike people don't ride their bikes on Soquel. You die. They come down the alley. OK, thank you so much. God bless you. Bless you all. Candace, two minutes, please. Yeah, I'll try, but also you gave people more time also. Um, so um, my name is Candace Brown. I live in East Morrissey. I live in Trevithin. Um, and I'm also on the Transportation Public Works Commission. But I'm here as a, a, a personal representative. Um, as you can tell, there's a lot of discussion about traffic, which I find interesting and not really <laughs> about housing today. So um, just to point out a few things. First of all, uh, this um, Hexagon Transportation Consultant, it was um, done by the owner uh, with a consultant. And they used numbers that were in the, um, you know, in the ITE trip generation manual, but they did not use the, um, really the guidelines of the City of Santa Cruz August 2021 Transportation Study Requirements for Development, which basically uses a totally different number for uh, evening peak, uh, so it would make a difference in consideration of a traffic study. And it also says in here, a traffic study will be required if a proposed project disrupts existing pedestrian, bicycle, or transit circulation. I think that you can, clearly say tonight that that is the case. So you really do need to think about this and you do need to do a, a, a traffic transportation circulation study here. Um, the intersection itself is not only problematic because it's askew and it's misaligned, but we haven't talked about the crosswalks. A lot of people get bumped in that crosswalk, people walking and bicyclists. I know people in the neighborhood that have been airlifted because they have been so severely injured. And many of these are not actually even reported. Um, I'm beginning to try to report them to the, the county coalition um, because um, we're trying to keep better statistics. Um, that also, even if you align it, then you're going to drive all the traffic into Trevithin. And most of that street, which is about 65 houses, most of it does not have sidewalks. We already have tracked during the peak period, uh, 600, 900 cars coming through Fairmont going down. And also, because of that, they're then trying to make a left because they are trying to get around um, Soquel. And also, that is where we see all the collisions. It's people going on Trevith and going left, and then people going northbound and Hageman going straight and a missile line. And there's a confusion about who has the right of way because one's over here trying to go straight and the other one's trying to make a left. And everybody's like, well, I have the right of way. I'm right there. So this is what happens. So this is why it's so problematic. The bicycle lane itself is very inadequate. We approved Vision Zero in 2019, and when are we going to execute? And we have a once in a lifetime uh, yeah. to set this back. The only other point I want to make is that if we do these set-asides, then the base of that unit would change the base numbers. And I was not able to see anything that established the calculation for the density bonus based on the tentative lot plot and the setbacks. And if it includes the, um, the piece that's been allocated, then that's really not part of the lot. And I'd have to talk to a lawyer, and I probably will, because I'm not sure if that is the proper way to do the calculation. And, right um, there in the staff report. One quick yeah, I looked question. for it in the staff report. I live, didn't find you it. You live down Trevithin, if I remember right. Is there traffic coming in that direction? You know, like toward your house? Are there speed bumps or? Well, we do have speed bumps, which is interesting. And yet we. I'm just trying to remember. It's so, just this innocent so, it, question, so I swear. basically, um, Walgreens is a convenience store. So I actually have the traffic report from 2016 when there was 32 okay. condos. And it's interesting because there's a lot of traffic going this way. There's a lot of traffic going the other way because they're all going to Walgreens. There's a lot of. Uh, people that go in there to get, you know, quick things uh, right after work. So there is a lot of traffic going both ways, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm certainly not disputing there's traffic on Soquel, that's for sure. And just to mention, um, Soquel is the third most uh, busy area, that intersection of the entire city. There's 25 to 33,000 cars per day. Thank you. I call it Highway 2. Hi, my name is Fred Maloof. I'm at 148 Forest Avenue. Uh, a couple things not mentioned or not made as clear. Uh, the left turn onto Soquel from Forest is not only hazardous because of traffic, but because it's blind. 
the restaurant blocks any view. So you have to inch out into traffic from the left. Yeah, don't do that. And so, so the other day I went around to Hegeman Light, and guess what? I was 10 cars back. I was blocking the alley. Um, <laughs> secondly, sidewalks are inconsistent in this neighborhood. So people walk in the streets. They walk their dogs. They walk their kids. So you double the traffic. You double the parking issues. And now you've got more safety concerns. And I think that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. So I, I am actually for housing. If this were across the street, where maybe there's more outlets for cars, I might not be as objectable to it. 35 units, OK, 35 units is too low. 84 is too high. So what yeah. about something in the middle? Hello, my name is Eric Bustamante. Um, first of all, I want to thank the neighbors uh, who came out here uh, to voice their concerns. Um, and, um, you know, you guys pretty much get the point, right? Everybody is against this project. You know, I understand the developers are here to run a business and make money. Fine, I don't blame them. But I do blame the people who are allowing this project to move forward, especially for how big it is. I know it's not to your concern because, I mean, you guys don't live there, right? West Side must be nice, correct? Yeah, I never, so, I never go on the um, east side. It's never been over there. Yeah, and then another thing, too. <laughs> Flannel guy came up here and said there's not too many people his, of his age up here. Well, I'm right here, and like I said, the neighbors have spoken. Thank you. I will make my comments very brief. I see a one minute on the timer here. but. Um, my name is Dave Cole, and I moved to Forest Avenue in 79. I bought my house in 80. Uh, I've been away for a while because I've taken care of an aging parent, um, but I'm back. And I walk that route and that alley every day, and I echo what people said. But I just want to add something that wasn't said. Um, I'm a real estate attorney. I do development work. I do land planning and development work, master plans, general plans, and have done what well, I've been doing for over 40 years. Uh, I no, the state has changed laws that requires you people who are doing an excellent job in a difficult circumstance to approve a lot of units. I know this because I get them I'm doing 130 approximately units right now in Orange County. I understand the, the rules here. But something was said at the beginning that I wasn't planning to speak, but he said, wait a second. Yes, I agree that the state has some crazy parking laws and that you, you know, you're not, we as municipalities are not allowed to, or you as the municipality are not allowed to go against that. But I strongly disagree. Carry on. Okay, thank you. I strongly disagree with the assertion that you're required to approve special uses, variances like a six foot height variance if you have a 40 foot and now you're going 46. I don't think there's anything in the state law that requires you to approve that, or 84 units when you could get 70 units or some other reasonable number. You've got, you've got a four story building going in there, and there's a reason that we have height restrictions. And it could be a three-story building. Um, I'm for development. I do this for a living. I can't wait to retire, frankly. But I just want to point out, you're not, you're not, unless the city attorney specifically directs you that you're required to, I do not believe that was a correct statement at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Francie, and I've lived on Hageman for 40 years, and um, my concerns are uh, to sum up the traffic problem, you know, with this development or without it, the SoCal area in that part of town is a disaster already. Um, you know, so, you know, with or without this. It's a disaster. And as I said in 2016, when the previous um, development was trying to get approval, when the VW... Um, oh, yeah, the Volks Cafe? Yeah. They, no, no, not the Volks Cafe. The, the whole dealership, Nissan, VW, they made a lot of concessions to the city, to the street of SoCal. They have a wide sidewalk. They have greenery. They have 
gardening. They have everything. I know that these people are asking for this, that, and the other thing. They're not conceding one thing, not one thing. They're not conceding, you know, any, so, okay, we're getting a wider sidewalk, but nothing to really help the traffic situation. I know they don't have to. They don't have to have 80 units. They can, they don't have to, but they can concede some of this and to get every other things that they want. Um, they don't have to do any of that, but they could. And as other people said, this is gonna end up like a slumlord situation and not really help any of our housing difficulty. It's just gonna be a problem. Um, so it's that, those are my concerns. Um, and with or without this project, there is no beautiful SoCal Avenue, bike lane, bike, pedestrian. That's why we use the alley. You know, we don't. <laughs> and so many other projects in this town, they had to put in a park. They had to do this. And then they could put their 170 units in or whatever. This, we're not getting anything out of this. Nothing, not a thing. We're just getting a slum, a slum development. Hi, my name is Ellen Manko, and I've lived on Mentel Avenue since 1988. I just want to say two things. One is, when you think about when, when the mock-up, the picture that they had, it, it shows a cosmopolitan city. We are a beach town. You know, I mean, I, I can't even tell you how ugly that looks to me. And aside from that, it's a, it's a behemoth. And I want to echo what the man said, the, the, the last man that spoke. It doesn't have to be four stories. You know, all of us would like to see some kind of, of affordable housing for nurses and teachers and service workers and, and that kind of thing. But four stories? And it, it, it just makes me wonder because if we have height limitations, then all of a sudden, then there's a waiver. You can waiver. You can have a waiver for height uh, recommendations. You can have. You can cut down heritage trees with a waiver. You know what I mean? I just. I don't even see the point of having limitations if you're just going to wave a magic wand and get your way. Just saying. All right, that was vigorous and good public comment. A lot of good things came up. <laughs> Deep breath, anyone else want to come speak? Come on up. I bet you're really sorry you said you live on the west side. That's OK. I would just. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> if it wasn't that, I would have said something else dumb. So yeah. <laughs> I'll respond later to that question. OK, so now we'll uh, close the public comment. Bring it back up here to the commissioners for some more discussion and a motion. Oh, I uh, forgot to offer the applicant a chance to rebut any of those public comments if they would like to. Thank you, Eric. I get a lot of you people are, are upset about this. Um, <laughs> I, 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 sorry, I, 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 I picked that up. Um, I, I would like to take one exception, though. Um, I take a lot of pride in my work, as I'm sure a lot of you do. Okay. And quite honestly, to be called a slumlord is a little insulting and unfair. Then tell us how you do it once, and we're leaving the map to see how the rest of it is. All right, all right, all right. Stop. I asked a question. So, applicant, applicant, so, stop. Yes. Speak to me. Sorry. Thank you for um, that gesture, but you see why it doesn't work that way. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I, I have a history of, of building quality projects. Um, I am trying to build a quality project. Um, I understand that a lot of people are upset about it. Um, I do not consider myself a slumlord. It is not my intent. Um, and that is the one comment I'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, well, maybe a commissioner who doesn't live on the west side wants to uh, start off. Uh, I'll start. Um, is that okay? Go ahead, yeah, please. Okay. Um, so I, I am your neighbor. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I live on Hanover, and uh, I just wanted to ask staff a couple things that came up. Um, could you speak to um, the management plan agreement and, and how that would be, um, if there is one associated with this project um, for the units? I was actually just having that little conversation with, with Samantha about that, and it's interesting that our I think our SRO section of our ordinance requires that, but the FDU does not. So I don't believe that is a requirement. Um, but that's not to say that you couldn't condition something like that if you wanted to have a management plan um, So, So submitted. we could condition something based on the SRO requirement that would probably be the simplest way since that language is already created? Yes. Okay. Yes. So hmm, where to start? Uh, so uh, we talked a lot about transportation and health and safety issue. I'm a bike rider, rode my bike here today. Um, I don't ride on Soquel. Um, I ride through Arana, I ride through that alley. Um, it's really dangerous. Um, and so uh, just know that um, I, I'm familiar with that area. And to me, the health and safety concerns are very compelling. Um, I also wanna just um, commend the neighbors for putting together a visual representation for folks who don't live on the east side um, <laughs> so that they could understand that there's some real concerns with Soquel, misalignment all along. Uh, that turn on to Frederick, which is kind of in my neighborhood, is you think you're going to get creamed every time you're stopped there. <laughs> so, um, but I just got to keep it short here. I do want to say some things about housing since I do and take a brief little opportunity to be on a soapbox really quick. So. The, the density bonus law at this state is um, really constrains our ability to get affordable housing, right? So we have, uh, I, other people would tell you it actually gets you affordable housing. From my perspective, it does the opposite. We have 20% inclusionary in this town. With density bonus, we usually get about 13%. I will say that this developer is actually giving us 16%. We all know that's not enough. So I just encourage you all to pay attention at the state level. Your assemblymen, your senators, that law is on the books and it's not going away anytime soon. And that really constrains what happens. And it also speaks to some of your concerns about just waiving things. It's designed to incentivize affordable housing. But from my perspective, if we're in a town that has 20% and you never get it, I don't know how that incentivizes affordable housing. Um, so the other thing I would just want to say is that, um, you know, we, this, this project, because of the way the laws are, it's gonna be really dense there, and it could have been more dense. They took a 25% bonus, they could have took up to a 50% bonus. And so I think as we talk through this, and I, I could go on and on, but I wanna leave space for everybody else, it's already nine o'clock. Um, but I do think that your health and safety concerns are compelling, and I would move, I would move to continue this and work on a plan that is safe for this neighborhood. Um, and I'll leave it there. All right, any other commissioners with comments or discussion? Just a general comment. Um, I wanna commend Ms. Dubin, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I think we all need to acknowledge that the changes to state law, they do, sorry to use the phrase again, It's they do create creates strong limitations to what we're able to do to uh, mod even modify proposals. Um, and I personally acknowledge that I'm strongly in support of densification generally. Um, but one thing I think needs to be said is that a lot of the uses that were described in the alley particularly, nothing in this proposal precludes it. I'm not saying that there isn't an impact 
but there's all the uses that are so cherished, they are not prohibited by this project. They are impacted. They are. I, I understand. I understand what you're saying, and I'm I'm just putting it out there that I don't. It does. It, there are no prohibitions put, being put on any of those uses. There are there are impacts. Right. I understand. Um, I would also like to say that every Santa Cruz every Santa Cruz neighborhood is unique. That's one of the things that was said. Um, there have been there's been 40 years of arguments being put forth about why this project can't be put in this location and. That project can't be put in that location, and it. I really think it's great that people are engaging on this at this level and with this kind of intensity to try to get the best solution possible. And I would just encourage you to keep doing that. Um, I would also, though, encourage you, everyone, to make yourselves familiar with the state laws that are being discussed here because they are, they're a result of that same trend of people, you know, just being very resistant to change of any kind. And it's, you know, for better or for worse, it's the reason that we have many of the affordability challenges that we have. So. Right on. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address the public on some of the comments I heard. And um, I think for me, one of the things I really love about this town is exactly the fact that we are near capacity tonight. Um, and there's a lot of passion in this neighborhood and a lot of, um, I think territoriality is the right term, but a lot of uh, care about the structure and function and livability of one's neighborhood, right? It's a really important factor in terms of quality of life, in terms of the way that we live, work, and play, the people that we interact with, and the uses that we have in our city. Right? It's a very, very important thing. So I do want you to know that I also live on the west side, but I also <laughs> took the time last night to drive down that alleyway and all the way to Arana Gulch and to do the UE and to make a left on Soquel Off Forest, okay? <laughs> Yes, it was 8 p.m., but I took the time to do it, okay? And then, and then, and then uh, I got up at 4.30 this morning, and I took my daughter to the emergency room, and I still showed up here. And the reason is because I care, okay? So I hear a lot of comments about how, you know, we're this, we're that, and, oh, it's not your neighborhood, you don't care. Like, I could have very easily called in sick to this meeting, and I didn't, because I wanted to be here, and I wanted to show up. Okay, so I need you to know that first. Okay, secondly, we are in a housing crisis, not just a housing crisis of market rate apartments, but also of affordability. Okay, and these things matter. Okay, and I have seen almost every single one of the people that I know and care about move out of this town because they can't afford to live here and they can't find spaces even if they could. So we have very, very intentional competing interests here in terms of, yes, we all want to live in a nice place, but we also want our kids to be able to live here. Okay, so I wanna put that on everybody's plate just so you know that, you know, this is, I think, one of the most important things to understand is that there are many different competing interests, there is no perfect project, and we all want your neighborhood to be just as good as ours. Okay, so I want you all to know that. And we'll move forward and we'll make decisions here, but I think that uh, that needs to be understood. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Conway. I'm not quite sure where to start either. Um, thank you for caring a lot about my town. I spend a lot of time over on exactly this street and I do understand the concerns. And also, I think fellow commissioners, thank you for addressing some of the needs that we have here. Um, <clears throat> and you know, this neighborhood, it, it was designed for car culture. It was, there's not good connectivity, this, um, as there should have been when it was, you know, 40 and 50 years ago. There should have been better connections 
um, from this street um, over to Frederick Street to get to Galt School, where my son went. Um, it's, it's problematic, and um, we're dealing with what's been built already. Um, I also want to remind everybody that as a community, uh, we decided when we adopted a general plan that we did not want growth and dense buildings within our neighborhoods. We wanted on the corridors. We did that on purpose. We have to do the growth. Four stories is not too much. Um, this, it, it is going to work better. Um, and, you know, and even as it is, we, we just don't have the opportunity um, to not approve this project. Um, I want to also say that I appreciate that the developer has taken great steps and is, will continue to take great steps to try to address the challenges of safety and circulation. Um, it's not all figured out. Um, we know that. We look at projects all the time. I'm absolutely insulted by the implication that this is going to be a slum. Uh, um, uh, that was a mistake. I am, if there is not the requirement, I spent 35 years working in housing, and um, management matters a lot. It's one of my passions. Um, one of the mistakes that we made, I think, as a city, is thinking that we were going to we were going to have a map for um, these dense buildings. And what that means when there's when you file a map, that means you have an APN and a unit that can be sold. And it's a nightmare of management, mostly for neighbors. I am so glad that this is going to be a rental project. We are going to expect it's going to be well managed. And um, I'm really happy, and I will be proposing a condition to make sure that there's um, an adequate management plan. This city does have standards for um, analyzing a management plan and expecting that it's going to be well done. Um, and it will be well done. Um, and I mean, I don't, I don't know these particular developers, but I do see the care that they've taken to try to address some of the complexity. Um, and I know that they'll continue to do that. Um, and I guess um, what I can say is I am going to be proposing um, at least um, two additional conditions. Um, I'm not ready to make a motion yet. Everybody hasn't spoken. One of them is going to be I think it is reasonable that the developer is required to maintain the alley along the frontage of their property. And um, I think we probably have language for that. Um, this alley is tremendously important. I've um, taught kids how to ride bike on this alley, too. Um, and also um, to make sure that we condition um, a management plan um, and um, that we find language that is um, acceptable to the developer for that. And I guess I'm done. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate your expertise in that area and your comments. Um, I also have a lot to say. Let me start with two quick kind of factual clarifications. Uh, Ryan, is the new alley wider or more narrow than the existing alley? You know, excluding the row of parking spots in both configurations. Because I'm trying to understand, I hear you all, but the alley is getting paved, and is it narrower or wider? Is it going to be Well, tighter? the alley itself is remaining 15 feet, but. Yeah. What's being proposed adjacent on their property along the alley is an extension of the pavement of the alley with those 90 degree parking spaces. So yep. visually, right. it's going to be go from 15 feet to, I think it's going to be around 10 feet between the back of the parking spaces. So don't quote me at 10 feet exactly, but around 10 feet. So basically, it's going to go from no, about no, 15 that's enough, that's enough. Yeah, to about you. 25 feet. So the alley will remain the same width, but will be paved by this project, at least behind their project. Follow-on question, I acknowledge the other business owner. We had this project, a similar project, like many years ago and went through all these scenarios. So could we condition this project to pave that alley all the way through if we wanted to? 
You know what I mean? Like this project clearly has nexus on that half, but what if they were willing to pave it all the way over? Curtis still here, I might, I might ask that of him, because I know that is, been, that's kind of a standard condition. Perhaps we can Come take on, some of the uh, burden off your shoulders, sir. So the project will be conditioned to pave the whole entire alley. Fantastic. For the whole, for the length along their, their property? From Forest to uh, Hagerman. From Forest to Hagerman, yeah. Oh, the whole thing. That's what Easy. I like. Thank right. you, Curtis. Simple answer. OK. OK, second question, kind of, um, so I'm, I can't express how against adding a driveway on Soquel is. All of our plans across the board, excuse me, are about eliminating curb cuts on our corridors. The reason we do that is because it's more walkable, it's safer, we get nice wide sidewalks. Um, I'm letting my own emotions come through. I have a, a three-year-old and a six-year-old. We're learning bike riding too. It's freaking terrifying taking my kids on Mission Street. And I hold my little daughter like this, you know, so I get it. But um, if that was a tree-lined, 10-foot-wide sidewalk with flourishing small businesses and cool things happening along there, again, not now, but in 50 years, that would be a great spot to be. So, um, so I'm against Soquel access. Is there any possibility to access off Hageman? I'm not even in favor of that idea, but you know, I wondered if I could ask staff and applicant to respond to whether that deserves a little more thought or if it's just like a no-go at this point. Well, I just want to like, you know, hear the neighbors and see. I agree. Those electrical rooms gotta go somewhere. It's probably a question best asked of the applicant, yeah. the, the architect. Great. Thanks for coming back for one more question. <laughs> this is my understanding, um, but my understanding is that we are too close to SoCal uh, that's it. to yep. create an entrance. Yep, 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 yep. You create a safety hazard at that intersection. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. Everyone, everyone's saying it's terribly unsafe now, too. You got it all out? <laughs> all right, uh, let me remind everyone, public comment time is over. <laughs> all right, um, so yeah. I went to Galt school. I rode my bike through this neighborhood like y'all wouldn't believe. You know, I'm 47. And we used to ride our bikes to Aptos on SoCal. So things change. But I want to, like, push back a little on that insulting comment that I don't care about your neighborhood. Um, let me let that go. Okay. <clears throat> With my kids and bikes and walking, I think it's speed that gets them. I want a narrow alleyway because no one can drive fast down a narrow alleyway. And I'm not worried about the Amazon guy bumping into my kid on a narrow alleyway because they're going two miles an hour because they're like this, you know? So I think people maybe should think a bit more about safety and traffic calming rather than stopping things. You know, per particular, I'm not making this up. Go do some research about what happens when you're hit by a car as a kid at 15 miles an hour as opposed to 26 miles an hour. Um, so I just like to say that. It's the speed that gets the kids. Also on my neighborhood is a project I approved up here where you can either go on Mission Street or you can cut behind the hotel through the parking lot. And we added some bike striping and stuff back there. And it's really nice, because if I'm not with my little girl worried about her going to Mission and getting run over, we go on the streetscape because it's nice. It's beautiful. There's four street trees there. There's public art. This is the Hampton Inn, you know, at the end of Mission. And so that's what I want for your neighborhood, too, is where you have the option to zip through the alley. I don't know about you all when you're in your sweatpants with your kid, you know, or if you're like me in 50 years, I'm not in a car. I'm in a wheelchair. I'm 97 years old, and I want a wide sidewalk with trees that my kid can push me down, you know. So you guys misconstrued that, and you could tell how car-focused all this comment was. It's all about turning in a car, turning in a car. 
I love bikes. I do not think 100% of people are going to ride bikes ever, but I want to create safe spots for old people in wheelchairs, kids on bikes, and I think this project increases safety on the Hageman sidewalk. I understand people disagree. At the intersection, crossing the intersection along SoCal, and critically in that alleyway. So that's why I'm in favor of this project. Just from a traffic thing, um, someone talked about peak traffic. Again, like, I don't care how many cars are going by, it's the one that goes by my daughter at 45 that I hate, but even the peak traffic number w was one car every 90 seconds, right? So that's how good traffic studies are. Like, I, you're all experiencing different traffic, but that's not a lot of traffic in my book. And, you know, you're going to have rush hour. So, end of day, um, I should respond to that 50-year thing again. I kind of took that personally. But um, I want to keep my vision 50 years from now, where I'm in my wheelchair, on SoCal. And I think by then, a little bit of it might have been converted from the hellscape of automobile capitalism that it is now that's been held in place by people not allowing any growth or any projects or any new thinking like apartments that's why socal is so bad today we like it Th this is a new mentality that's looking forward and it's not stuck in a past where we're burning fossil fuel in our cars and stuff it, it's a lot more like awesome it, than how that. it is Unfortunately, and I wish I'm 47, right? So I'm thinking 50 years, I hope to be here. It's changing. It's changing. We cannot keep it the same. I wish we could. I like a lot of it. I liked riding my bike to SoCal, you know, on SoCal to Aptos. But things have changed. So um, that's what I have to say. I can't make any conditions. If any other commissioners would like to add a condition, Making it five street trees instead of three, I'd love it. I expect there may be some more discussion. Oh, okay. What's that? Who's got a call? Oh yeah, somebody. you've got. We're, we, we've Who would like to go first? <laughs> would that be you, Cindy? Uh, well, we'll just keep it going down the line. Power for you, Mike, is fine with me. Is that all right? That is absolutely all right. perfect. Um, so, a couple uh, additional comments here. Uh, as I mentioned, there are going to be a lot of units that go in this spot, full stop. And I'm not, we have very limited ability to do anything about that or really talk about that. Um, I, once again, will say I don't think 17 units or 14 units is enough. It's 16%, but that is actually more than we usually get, and that's the law. So. We all as a community need to think about how we get more affordable housing. We need to subsidize that, so we have to create revenue streams to do that because developers, even developers who are giving a little extra, are never gonna meet the demand. So I think as a community, I just wanna put it all out there that we all as a community, if we want affordable housing, everybody says it all the time, we need to figure out how to subsidize the creation of that housing. Otherwise, we are only gonna get on a good day, 16%. So there's a little soapbox again. But I will say that I do feel like there are a lot of smart people involved in this project that work for the city um, that really, um, admittedly, you know, the developer and the architect said, you know, we didn't really think about the flow so much. And I think that. Um, we need to do that at this place. There is going to be a ton of units that go in here, so I think we need to think about that. So um, I'll put a motion on the floor and see if I can get a second. I would like to continue this with the specific direction to focus the continuance on the traffic flow um, and coming up with a plan that may allow um, some of the concerns about bl blocking up the alley um, and I don't know what the solution to this at. I'm not a traffic engineer, but I would like to make a motion to continue this item um, so that we could uh, work with the developer and the architect to come up with a plan that is safer than what is proposed right now. We'll see if I can get a second. Second for delaying the housing project. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, Commissioner Dawson, did you have further comments? 
Uh, Commissioner Conway. Um, I'd like to move approval of the project, and I'd like to propose, um, a, and I'll need help with the language, um, I would like to require, uh, add an additional condition that is going to require... Hey, Tess. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, that's going to require um, the developer to maintain the alley at their... Um, uh, property line um, and maybe not the whole alley um, and also that's going to condition a uh, them to uh, submit a management plan that meets the city standards and is approved by the planning director I think that's what the language says as I recall Put a, we, while, while you guys were discussing and we kind of did a okay. quick um, draft for you let me know if that works or if you'd like me to add to that I wish it would be repaved and maintained between Hagman and Forest. So I think I think we heard it is already going to be repaved. It's, it's going to be a, a condition of approval already. Um, and what I'm proposing is that it will be an ongoing, that'll be maintained on an ongoing basis. So the developer will be responsible for making sure that those mm -hmm. potholes are filled. Um, is, is it... Um, is there a nexus to require them to do the whole alley? I'm not. I'm just not clear on that. It seems to me it might be that might not be um, that might be. Too much. I questioned that as well, but that was something I think that Curtis said. If I heard you correctly, I, I know I heard him say that they have to improve it, and what I'm wanting to add to that is a requirement to um, maintain at least their frontage. And it seems like it might not. There might not be a nexus to have them do the whole thing. But the original condition is for improvement of the alley. The whole thing, yeah. So that's paving if it mm -hmm. needed, or slurry ceiling, whatever, depending on the condition of the alley. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as maintaining it long term, uh, we've never done anything like that, but mm -hmm. we could. I, I mean, mm -hmm. we could condition it that way. If the applicant could maintain it. Um, currently, Public Works does not maintain. It. Right. And, and just to clarify, is it along the southern edge only of, of this project, or is the entire stretch beyond uh, that's behind the neighboring uh, commercial property? That would be the alley. I drove through there recently. The alley's in bad shape. It's, in, yeah. it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we were going to require that because it's going to get more traffic volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it the makes next step. To get yeah. to that one part of the alley, you got to mm -hmm. go through the other side. A well, lot of the time. I, I mean, I appreciate that most of the development, the traffic is really for the development is on the Hageman side, um, which and which is going, which means it's, it's providing more use. It, to me, it see, does not seem unreasonable um, to require them to maintain it along the, along their section along of the property. Along their frontage. Okay, so I could or I could add some language that specific to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, getting getting some final language in there. So repave the whole thing and just maintain their half. Ma maintain their um, portion. Be responsible for the ongoing maintenance um, of their frontage on the alley. And that's my motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. And um, I wanted to make a possibly a friendly amendment here. Um, I want to see what the language ends up being here really quickly. Sorry. No worries. So maybe just the part that abuts the okay. property in question. Mm -hmm. Don't say that, but something like that. <laughs> Can I so, ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So are we saying that the pavement is going to take place along the entire length of the alley, but the maintenance is only on their frontage? That the developer is required yeah. to um, install um, 
the improvements, improvements. I'm and just saying on an ongoing basis just their frontage just their front that's what I'm proposing should we just ask the applicant if they want to do the whole alley and then um, for my friendly amendment I just wanted to offer something I sent some language to uh, Ryan and Tess I'm not sure who to Send this to, but um, the alley will preserve the safety of pedestrians, bicyclers, strollers, and other non-vehicle uses at all hours to the satisfaction of the public works director and or planning director. I'm going to throw that out and see what my colleagues thought about that and the maker of the motion. Just got your email, so I have it, I have it here now. <laughs> um, I love the idea. I'm not sure what it means in practice. Um, so, um, figuring out the safety, I, I, what, what I heard from both both the developer and the architect is that they are continuing to consider and prior to submitting um, for their building permits, they're going to be working with staff to figure out um, what safety enhan enhancements they can do. And I think that's all we're asking. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you, was that your intent? So my intent here is to include uh, to the extent possible, work with the public works director and planning director to make sure that pedestrians, bicyclists, strollers, and other non-vehicle uses are safe passing through that alley as opposed to SoCal night and day to their satisfaction, to Lee's satisfaction, to Curtis's satisfaction. So I don't know what that means. I don't think that's up to me, but um, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but <laughs> I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that because I, 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 I really agree with the intent. I just don't know what it means. Sure. Thanks for that question. Um, I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And I think what that would mean in practice is we would evaluate any uh, conflicts that occur out there, um, accident rates, um, and our public works team does track accidents. And if those were to occur, then we'd be looking at installing um, improvements or, or um, uh, mitigation measures, whatever that may be. You know, that could be um, convex mirrors or um, that could be um, beacons, flashing beacons, something of that nature to um, alert individuals to um, whether it's bicycle or stroller or pedestrian traffic or vice versa to vehicular traffic that's coming out. So, um, you know, our public works team would take the lead in that, um, but we we could um, look at a condition like this to um, uh, to help um, require the developer to put in um, some of those types of improvements should we uh, find that conflicts are occurring? I, I think my intention here is to give enough leeway in the language so as not to make specific requirements, but to rely on mm -hmm. the professional opinion mm -hmm. of our city staff to make sure that that alley is safe for people walking, biking, strolling, or e-biking now. We got kids going 25 miles an hour on these e-bikes and me. skateboards and unicycles or whatever kind of weird stuff people are doing, right? So people can use this alley so they don't have to go on SoCal if they don't want to. So here's my question, and again, I, I heartily embrace the intent. When I, um, if, if um, having been a developer, of um, I am concerned if five years from now a change is required, and I'm not sure, are we, are we putting a condition on the property um, that is going to, you know, how is that going to show up? Or, or are we putting a condition for the city um, to make this a priority? It's a city requirement. And I'm all right with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my intent is not to be onerous, okay. but to respect what the neighbors who know their neighborhood probably best yeah. are saying, but I just also... I not sure how it was going to be in Yeah, first. <laughs> sure. But also to move this project forward with that in mind. Um, OB so, first real quick. Oh, yeah. I feel like this happens already. I just want to say that. So I think we're just adding a condition okay. to make it very clear, which is great. But, you know, I'm thinking of all the projects with all the mm -hmm. weird parking lot on a hill things. And right. They, and they do get worked out. So there's, mm -hmm. again, as long as we're not going to, like, trigger yeah. some mm -hmm. death loop. And, and maybe, good. yeah, and maybe it is. I just wanted to spell this out mm -hmm. for this particular project so that it's very clear. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that might help 
is to put the responsibility on the developers because this is a little bit open-ended. So maybe like the developer shall be responsible um, or shall be required to work with the city um, to, you know, determine um, safety, um, you know, but, but put, put change the wording so it's more on the developer to work with us rather than just the alley shall be paved. Right. The, mm -hmm. I, I could wordsmith with you, which would be the property owner shall be responsible to, um, in coordination with the city, maintain the alley in a manner that preserves the safety of pedestrians and so forth. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm good with that. Lee, you're good at that. Maybe build and maintain. Is that too hard? What's that? Build and maintain. Otherwise, your words. Oh, uh, you mean um, to, oh, where, would you, where would you? Where would you? Where would you? Where were you putting in building and maintaining? You were saying maintaining, but I was thinking of like signs and flashing lights and stuff. Oh, right, right. Maintaining, getting that. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that correction um, or that suggestion because it could be something that um, is an, an, an actual addition. Um, I, I think what um, we, what was missing right here, uh, okay, you've got to work with the city to preserve the safety of the alley. Um, and uh, improvements could be improvements or um, changes to the, at the end, you could just say improvements um, or changes to the alleyway may be required by the director of public works. To address those safety issues, that's good. May be required okay. to achieve the uh, or to maintain the safety. So get rid of achieve. Be required to maintain the safety in coordination with the director of public works. And get rid of to achieve there. So yeah, that's my friendly amendment, all that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I offer yep. one thing? Okay, um, we have a condition, do we have a condition for three trees, is that it? The three trees that are there now will remain. Okay. Can we go to the rendering, uh, the perspective uh, with the traffic? Mm -hmm. Where there's five. Can we find that? And you know, I. I actually, um, I want to hear this, but I wasn't quite ready to move on. Um, I'm sorry. Nope, that's okay. I, I want to hear this one too. Um, but before we move on, um, my concern about, and, and again, I, I, I like the idea that it's going to be reviewed and um, that there's some teeth. I think the neighbors know where to go to do it. Um, and the language is a little bit squishy on um, where the cost is going to go. and. You know, I do feel concerned that um, uh, we have been known in the past um, to burden projects with um, enough additional and vague costs that it can be hard to get them um, to get a construction loan, for instance. And I just want to make sure that we're not, um, that we are both keeping our eye on the ball for enhanced safety. We're asking the developer to stay at the table. Um, but we're also saying that we know that this is a city alley and a city responsibility as well. And I want to make sure that everybody thinks that that's what was stated in, by the language there. A little bit vague. <laughs> there, there is some vagueness to it. I think that is in recognition that um, we aren't sure what uh, safety concerns and considerations may arise, or are, nor are we sure about um, what um, improvements would be required. Um, I, I do think that um, the types of improvements are fairly limited in terms of what can be done there, and I, I don't think that they would be excessively costly. I think okay. one thing you, you could do is, um, if it is the pleasure of the commission, um, request uh, of the applicant whether or not they have any concerns with that condition. Planning on doing that. I just want to get all the conditions mm -hmm. out of here, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk to you all how you feel about them. Okay. All right. That's good then. I'm good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Good then. Go ahead. I just wanted to point out the five trees in the rendering and say yes. I'd like to, I'd like to make a, a motion to 
change the condition to reflect the rendering that's provided. Um, so add a condition. Just change the, the existing. Mm -hmm. it, I, the, yeah, I mean, I guess that, um, again, I agree with the intent, but mm -hmm. as it was, and you know this, um, the, uh, we'd like to make sure, I mean, if possible, there's got to be some squishy language because we know it could completely screw up um, underground utilities. Or <laughs> so on the alleyway improvements, uh -huh. uh, we have never improved an alley with you know, very rarely we've ever put sign up, sharrows, uh -huh. flashing rapid beacons, uh -huh. things like that. So we got to be real careful with this language because. We're not going to start doing that on because if we do it on this alley, then every other alley is going to be on it. Yeah. So I, I think there's some mitigation that could be done with some, maybe some signage on the private property side, saying you know, one way left turn, kind of like they have what the ingress egress coming out of the structure. I think that would be better. I just don't want to get in a situation with public right. works that all of a sudden every alley wants all this safety. Mm -hmm. And a lot of signs are not going to make it instantly safe either. So we Correct. Really acknowledge that. And then on the street trees, so conceptually we looked at the plans and we work with fire and parks and rec to come up with adequate trees. Uh, there is utility conflicts and fire has conflicts with access to the building for fighting a fire. Okay. So we came up with three trees on the frontage. Could more be added? That's possible, but if you condition it as five, there's no guarantee that it's right. Fair enough. Mm, give them an app. Mm -hmm. Condition yeah. and attempt. Sure. We could we could include a condition and just say if if um, supported by the fire department, you know, oh, city departments or if feasible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. fine. Yeah. It's not going to be feasible, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah. At least we're fighting for it. I just had a question mm -hmm. for Commissioner Conway, I think, um, on your condition around the management plan. Yes. So, you know, staff said that we have, like, specific language with, like, requirements of what's included in a management plan and all that. And I'd just like to see this condition tied to to kind of what we have in place so it's not so we don't have a back and forth with the developer of like they give a management plan it doesn't have the stuff so can we just say and I'm not sure the best way to do that and this is kind of your and I I do agree with that and I actually accepted a finalized management plan maybe we could say that that meets a city standard because there is a standard yeah the the provision that's currently contained in the SRO ordinance states, uh, the management plan shall contain management policies, maintenance plans, rental procedures, tenant rules, and security procedures. Mm -hmm. So that's the specificity of it. So w could a friendly amendment be the management plan that meets the uh, existing city standards? Would that, would that tie it to this SRO or do we need to call it the SRO specifically? Yeah, it's not technically an SRO project. So if you wanted to pull, uh, you know, language, I just sort of state that verbatim. We point to that into the provision. Yeah. Or, or, or we provision could point or to, just... we could call out the section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-four. Either one. 12, but 10, 40, yeah, I'm 50. good with. I, I, I agree. Specificity yeah. helps. I mean, because I will say it's pretty comprehensive. It's not just like, hey. There's a bill, you know, it's maintenance plans, it's it's the whole Okay. Did we get there? I think we went, we were pretty much there. Okay. I'm thinking of like she'll provide two speed bumps in the alley, but now I'm kind of getting carried away. They'll figure it out. <laughs> no. I'm trying to be objective and specific <laughs> and standards. Yeah, that's right. All right, I'm good. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, uh, no, but I'd love to hear what the developer has to totally. say. Totally. We got the language pretty Otherwise, good. Otherwise, so we have, we have um, an amended motion. Um, we've accepted it. Do we need a, a second on the whole amendment? I don't think so. 
does both the maker do I need to accept make a new motion with all these as, as no. no we don't need it to was he was asking it was friendly he seemed yeah, it was friendly fun. about it fun. we're good all right, now it's all that <coughs> we're, okay. we're good 65 through 68 yeah. and all the all other right. stuff I'm good okay. Has it, got it okay has anyone seconded yeah. yes he did mm -hmm. yeah. okay point, though. Mm -hmm. um, we'll uh, excuse me ma'am public comment period is over I'm sorry to say we wanted to um, uh, mm -mm. We wanted to ask. Can we Vince. hear from the applicant uh, how they feel about these conditions? I'd like to again highlight that it's in the applicant's interest to have this alleyway be an awesome place too. So I think this supports you, but I just want to hear a response. Uh, uh, so I'm um, just going to go uh, one by one. 65 management plan. We've done HUD deals. We're very familiar with the management plan. Um, we are interviewing local managers. Uh, we expect to manage this in a professional manner. Um, Alleyway, um, obviously, I would rather not pay for the entire alleyway, um, but I understand that that's important, and uh, I agree that maintaining the alley behind our property is fair. Um, however, I think 67 is too squishy to... If we had something specific, um, I, uh, Commissioner Conway, I, I entirely agree with you. Uh, I'm for it. I am happy to work with Public Works and, uh, and the Planning Department and come up with some specifics that um, will ensure that. Um, but as it is, it's kind of open-ended, yeah, right? And it, my concern is, is uh, in an extreme case, a, uh, you know, a six-year-old goes in there on a tricycle and falls, um, and somehow I get tied back into it because the alleyway wasn't safe. Um, so I, I am happy to work with everybody involved to make sure that uh, that what we have is as good as we can possibly get it, but I'm a little concerned that that is just a little too open-ended. And with regard to additional street, uh, street trees, um, honestly, I think we got to three because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and but it wouldn't kill you if there's... You know what, if, if we can put another tree in there, in there. I, honestly, um, you know, uh, know, urban cooling, et cetera, et cetera, I don't know, it's great. Um, but I, you know, once again, just concerned about setting an expectation that yeah, yeah. is not up to us. Mm -hmm. Understood. So, any, any questions on that, Commissioners? You grew up reading the Lorax, so, you know, hope springs <laughs> eternal. I think you have a valid concern on 67. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I share that concern. Do you have a better... Some well, I, I guess I would ask what would you be more comfortable with in terms of that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, I think I think it's awesome. important to have something. And I do otherwise trust that that would happen, but I think we do need to probably spell this out, but I'm happy to work with you on this. I, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm happy to work with, with planning so that we can, we, and we will continue to improve. Um, but yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a tough one to codify, right? That's. Does the turn? Do you want to speak? Did it leave yet? Oh, uh, sorry. Just give you the opportunity if you'd like to. And I think Lee has some thoughts too. Oh, excuse me. Which is always helpful. Thank you, commissioners and um, the public. It's good to see good turnout on these events. So I'd like to say again, it's good to work with you guys on a on a good yeah. product here um, as a consensus solution. Yeah, we share those concerns with 67. I can't see as drafted. There's a way for it to be enforceable. And for us to take on that liability is far outside the norm. Um, I would, I think we could be open to having discussions with um, the city to make sure safety concerns are addressed, but to push that liability um, on is maybe the step too far. Yeah. Okay. There may be an opportunity to identify um, certain improvement that the developer um, would be willing to um, to do. Uh, you know, from a, a public works transportation perspective, I don't think that um, uh, we'll be able to identify all of those right here. But um, you know, if it's the will of the commission, we we could add a few things, um, you know, such as installation of mirrors, installation of speed bumps, installation of um, uh, beacons, um, 
and um, I'm not sure if, if our public works um, representative here has, has other ones that they may want to include. Those are just some of the things that come to mind to me right now um, off the top of my head. And um, those, I think, give a, a greater degree of certainty to the applicant um, about the, um, the potential implications of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So should I traffic engineer that alley? <laughs> two speed bumps, two sharrows, <laughs> two mirrors. That's just nothing's going to catch on fire if we do that. It's not going to break their budget. I'm pretty sure. I think I think the conditions say work actively with the public works department on improvements. Truthfully, we don't want, want a lot of improvements in there because once they put get put in the alley, then know, yeah. like all of a sudden we own them, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, speed bumps in the alley. Could be dangerous if someone's riding a bike at nighttime. Uh, typically, speed bumps are shut off, you know, mm -hmm. bike lanes, gutters, and things like that. Putting one in the alleyway mm -hmm. could be a hazard. So, I'm not a transport uh, traffic engineer, and so our transportation manager would have to weigh in on that. But uh, I think there's some things that can be done on the private property side, and maybe some minor things in the public right of way. But if you place something in the public right of way, yeah, maybe you go to council. It, right. Approachman permit and yep. things change. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of the realities, yeah. as always, public works. Is there something that we could say that would be the property owner will work with the city um, to uh, ensure that the design of the alley addresses the use by pedestrian, cyclists, strollers, and non vehicle uses? Um, and maybe just leave it at that. So we've got a condition in writing that, but it's really through the development process, and it's going to be, and it's going to um, also support the city's goals and limits. I see you leave a new thought. Maybe they can just do this on their side of the line. Like signs, you certainly could. We saw a diagram of that already. But then they're not like reaching out into this other city land. Go ahead. Um, our assistant director here had a, a great suggestion that okay. may be amenable to um, the developer, which is that um, they would offer up uh, a certain dollar amount uh, uh, to work with the city should these issues present themselves. And um, then um, that could go towards some of these improvements should um, they arise due to, to conflicts. That would, that would limit their liability, um, and it doesn't predispose what outcome that would be. So it's a dollar amount, and I mean, they're they're already going to be paying some kind of um, traffic, traffic impact, impact fee. fee, I assume. So are we talking about in addition? Are we, mm. is, that, is that what we're trying to do mm -hmm. is? That would be an addition. The traffic impact fee is not going to go towards in towards the exactly. alleyway. Um, so I think, you know, there may be some, some small amount that, you know, is agreeable to the developer that also could could help go towards whether they're mirrors or that would um, be a containment of uh, assignment also mm -hmm. i'm just reconsidering this whole adventure now mm -hmm. it's very complicated what dollar amount we just pull I'm, a number out of the air like what's fair 20 grand 50 grand 80 grand i don't know i don't want to get too heavy in this but one mitigation device could be like we, when you have a front, a zero setback frontage, and there's a parking garage or something, there's an actual warning device when a car is pulling in or uh, pulling out. Excuse me, uh, maybe something like that can be placed on the property that people in the alley could see if they were traveling from east to west. That would, you know, it would flash vehicle backing up. Yeah, and it's on their side of the line. Correct, but it'd so still be on. It would be on the private property side. It's just cleaner that way for maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's responsible for what? I dig that idea. We did this on the Front Street project, the number I always forget, but the boomerang shaped one. Oh, yeah. It's got a nice five, 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 five. And then it hasn't been built, but 831 water, which I believe Mark is on. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, that had that same similar thing. Correct. Uh, applicant, want to think about that for a minute and see what you think? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking. Even a, even a light, you know, right. a flashing light might not be. Right. It could be challenging in the evening. Well, if, if you live next door to it. That's what right. I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, again, I, I 
think we're all in agreement with our um, concern about um, the, you know, uh, with the safety of the alley. Um, and I think we also have to balance the impact on the city. You know, the city's got policies about, um, you know, what they can do, and I understand that too. I had to built an ADU back in the day when I had to improve the alley. Um, so I'm not, sh I'm not sure, um, Mike, how, how we can find a way, because I think what you want to say is that this matters, and we know it's going to matter on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that we, that we found a way that's going to work. Do you have another idea? No, I, I don't, other than um, asking the developer if they have uh, an idea for something that might address the concerns of the commission and community as it relates to this that would provide enough certainty for you that um, it's not so loose and open-ended. I would love to come up with something we could engineer tonight, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a traffic engineer, um, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I do have to agree with public works. Like I can't take on no. responsibility yeah. and liability no. for, a, for a public right away. Exactly. Um, I am happy to work mm -hmm. with whomever to make sure whatever is on private property mm -hmm. is as respectful and supportive of that as possible. Yeah. Um, but just from a function, yeah. uh, actually writing it point of view, and more importantly for me, taking any sort of liability for a public right of way that mm -hmm. ultimately I'm not supposed to, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, it's a city street. So mm -hmm. I don't know how we get there. I, I'm, I'm with you in the spirit, right? And you know, it, it, as much as there are people who would disagree with me, we, we've we've tweaked the project a lot to make sure that we are not um, right. using that alleyway as much as possible. Right. Um, so um, I'm, I'm with you in spirit. I just don't know how that's possibly going to get actually codified in a way that you know, you know, everybody's lawyer's friend isn't going to have a field day with. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I think what we're expressing is what my concern was, but I do think maybe there's a way that we can say is just soften the language. The property owner and the city um, will work to, uh, or rather, how about this, prior, prior to submittal of um, f building plans, mm -hmm. the property and the city shall work together um, to ensure um, the uh, you know, safety of the alley and the ways that we've yeah, talked yeah. about. To, to maximize alleyway safety. To, ma to maximize yeah. all the way, and you're going to come to an agreement um, together, and you're going to submit it as part of your building package. Yeah. So I like that because it expresses our concern, and it doesn't burden these folks, and we're not inventing And we make you guys look at yeah. it really carefully. Good? No, I, I think that's good, and, and I want to, you know, you have a legitimate concern, and I want to respect that, too. Um, yeah. by, I, I wish I could wordsmith this better. I'm running on, like, 18 hours right now, so. Right, we're, we're <laughs> I, I think the, the, the challenge is in, until we have, right. you know, engineers come up with specific, mm -hmm. you know, hey, this is gonna, yeah, yeah. this is gonna fix things. No, totally. Yeah. I, I, so. I, I think it's enough, at least in my view, to assess what you know a reasonable person would consider to be concerns and to try to address them. I'm not sure how you write that, but yeah. I and I'm happy to, you know, if yeah. you want to write something that you know we try try to address it, I'm happy to try to address it. Um, that's good. You know, uh, that, at the end of the day, it's still an alley, so. City, uh, to address the safety concerns in the alleyway, um, including to, to ensure the safety, you can cut out that middle part, the proposed responsible to work with the city, all that. Preserve the safety of the alley for pedestrian, cyclists, strollers, leave that language in there. Yeah. Um, but remove the language about, um, so that responsibility and there's, take the shell out, and I think we're almost there. I just delete everything after that period. Right. Yeah, you, is it may, does that do go. it for you? How about that? Mike, does that do it for you? I mean, that encapsulates the spirit of what yeah. we're talking about for sure. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I like the pedestrian, bicyclist, stroller language. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd personally like that in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh what we're asking I get at this point is now to assess and address. And think about it. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think that's. That limits your liability and uh, also, you know, takes into the consideration the and safety for formally, the neighbors. And it formally expresses the concern of the community. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, my suggestion would be that um, in front of safety, we put pedestrian, and I don't know, but does pedestrian encompass bicyclists and yeah. strollers pedestrian, at Pedestrian, bicycles, all? strollers, wheelchairs. All at all safety, in, yeah. yeah, in the alleyway. All right. Okay. Thank you. Missed. Thank you. We missed the last part of the So while you finalize that language, I wanted to address the neighbors. Now is your time to work with city staff very intensively to get what you want, because I assume you're <coughs> going to appeal to council. But the process goes on, and please respect these professionals. They're here to help you. They will help you, you know, get something worked out so we're not all at the council. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask a related question? Can I ask the applicant, <clears throat> do you have a traffic study, a traffic analyst on board? There is a uh, traffic, I forget the correct term for mm -hmm. the traffic. Engineer, traffic yeah, yeah. consultant. Yeah, the, there's, um, one, there's one in your package. Yeah. Right, Yeah. For, but it doesn't really address the alley. I'm just wondering if there could be some recommendations that could come from that person and maybe that's what the language is based on? Is, is that something that you could uh, ask them to append to their scope of work? Uh, we certainly can ask it. I, I you know, a, a traffic engineer actually coming up with solutions. But I'm know, just they, saying, they, yeah, we're no, missing I, I, the specificity, yeah. right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if there was a way to kind of condition it to say, you know, you'll uh, you know, uh, detail your consultant to come up with the high points for preserving safety within the property boundary. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I'm not against that whatsoever. I'm wondering if that's better done by somebody in public works, but, you know. Well, public, uh, the city isn't going to be really happy about taking on that responsibility either. Yeah. I'm just saying, if you have someone that's, that is familiar with the project I mean, already. We can, we can certainly, uh, and again, I'm, I'm just worried about kind of the squishiness there. But, yeah, but if, if you want us to go to the traffic engineer and say, do you have specifics? The, the neighbors are concerned about X. That's what I'm saying. Specific exactly. suggestions. We are absolutely happy to. Do. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's really yeah. Yeah. that's really what I'm thinking. Is then we are having an engineer look at it. We're getting specific measures to consider, and we're drawing a line around it mm -hmm. for the property. Does and that it would need be, to be in the condition, or can we just ask him to do it? I, yeah. I, I, I'll leave that to the staff. I don't know how you would I feel like the language might have addressed that. We've talked about that <laughs> publicly, and we're adopting it. Yeah, I'm comfortable with them. Yeah. the commitment. Sounds like less language. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did have one more point, one thing to clarify. Okay. Um, this was, did, did you decide that this was only going to be required on the private property portion of the alleyway, or were we thinking they would be required to do improvements on? If, 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 if I may, uh -huh. I... I can't take. Properties. I can't yeah, do I improvements on, on city on public, city land. Yeah. Exactly. I think private property. Exactly. I think yeah. that's. I think yeah. that was one of the things we agreed on. I think so private is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an opinion. Are you happy with that? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, it's still taking on a life of his own, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's getting we longer go. and longer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Right. Good. If there's no more discussion, I'd like yeah. to offer a roll call vote, please, on the motion and the uh, seconds. Can I just clarify this is a motion to accept these new conditions and not the entire project, or is it for the whole kit and caboodle? Uh, I understand. The whole I kit and caboodle. The, the motion was to everything, and then the, the project. The amendments were accepted by the maker of the motion. Right? Yes. Sweet. I did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? No. Kelvy? Aye. Cole Hamas? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. All right, that does it. Thanks, everybody, for your time. 
Uh, we'll move on to the end of our agenda. What's next? Okay. Announcements? Subcommittees? Chair Kennedy. Oh, we have a whole other mm -hmm. item. We have a whole yeah. other Let's take a 10-minute recess I, before we address agenda item number two. Can I maybe make a motion to continue that to the next commission meeting? No. no. Why? I mean, you can. Yes. <laughs> Does Cindy have a second? It, so I... You know, I know Mike's had a long day. I've also been up since four for another meeting. reason. I don't think these are simple amendments. I think they're actually gonna take some time to go through. So I would like to give them the due time. Um, we're at 10-10 now. So I'd love to make a motion to continue this to the next meeting. Do we have a second? All right, 10 minute recess. We'll be back quick and finish it off. Uh, we have to make a motion to go past eleven. If you go past eleven, you got to make a motion, right? Okay. So that's yeah, good, if good, there good, is good. the cutoff. Then. All right, everybody. Let's get started again on agenda item number two. Uh, Ryan, we have the staff report on the downtown plan amendments. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> it's you again. <laughs> um, I'm trying to just get through this quickly. Um, so yes, uh, we are proposing some downtown plan amendments. Um, the main reasoning behind is to, for some streamlining processes to minimize unnecessary delays, updating standards that have proven to be problematic, ensuring consistency throughout the many sections of the plan, and updating the plan to address uh, recent state law changes. So kind of going through um, each of these, and I wasn't sure if I debated Eric suggested just going through the red line, but I prepared this anyway, so we can always bring it up if you'd like to okay. uh, mm -hmm. after this. So I'm um, just kind of just give you just a quick overview. So um, we're looking at eliminating um, administrative use permit requirements for ground floor supportive and transitional housing uh, and existing ground floor residential units and for small and large family daycare units and existing ground floor residential units, making them principally permitted uses. Um, also eliminate for upper floor multifamily residential. Uh, this change would bring the plan into consistency with state law uh, and simplify the streamline certain, uh, uh, streamline certain residential and daycare uses in, in the downtown. Um, regarding theater and commercial entertainment, we get, over the years, you know, we get various inquiries about you know, different types of um, entertainment type uses in the downtown and it's a little limited in terms of how it's described in our or listed in our, uh, our use table. So um, we're looking at expanding that description for theaters and commercial entertainment to include arcades, billiard halls, and other rec indoor recreation uses in order to more fully encompass the different types of recreation recreational uses that would be acceptable uh, in the downtown area. This includes um, a new ground floor footnote to require that recreational uses or other active ground floor uses be visible from the street frontage. Um, also amending a ground floor the footnote, um, specifically footnote number two, which would amend the ground floor uh, multifamily housing to include supportive and transitional housing and flexible density unit housing to limit the frontage of residential lobbies and leasing areas at the ground level and the Pacific Avenue retail district and to provide other clarifying language. Um, flexible density units were recently added to the zoning code, so this provides consistency with the downtown plan. Uh, supportive and transitional housing was added so that those units are treated the same as other multifamily residential uses consistent with state law. And the frontage uh, with limitations for residential lobbies um, and leasing areas has been included to maintain the retail and active uses along Pacific Avenue. We, we commonly get you know, developers wanting to just have the whole frontage be lobby and kind of this bed space. So we really want to maintain that active um, span of retail along Pacific specifically. Um, looking at amending the regulations for hotels and motels, limiting uh, language regarding the locations and prohibiting hotel rooms on ground level frontages along the river walk, uh, uh, level ground level frontages and along the river walk level frontage. Um, this change actually this change actually reflects previously approved changes made by city council in 2017 that were inadvertently left out of the coastal commission's um, previous approvals. So we're 
Tracer for bringing that back and getting it approved by the LCP. Um, in the additional height zone areas uh, of the downtown plan, we're doing some cleanup um, to remove language that is redundant in terms of density bonus law, which already allows additional height for waivers. Um, amend additional height zone B criteria to eliminate by including a concentration of new housing. Um, this existing language is, is overly limiting as it only takes into consideration projects that include housing, which is not consistent with the city policies that encourage visitor serving uses in the downtown and specifically within, within the coastal zone, um, nor is it consistent with policies of the downtown plan and general plan that support a mix of uses in the downtown as a means to support economic and cultural activities. Um, we're also adding a section to the downtown plan regarding rooftop amenities um, to encourage the use of rooftops for amenity space, such as rooftop bars and pools, uh, including a section on activated rooftop amenities because I mean, the reality is open space is really limited in the downtown, so this is one way to provide open space in the downtown area. Um, the proposed amendment allows community <laughs> amenities, including rooftop bars and pools, shade structures, and associated access uh, facilities to extend no more than 15 feet above the otherwise maximum allowable height. Um, these improvements are required to be set back at least 15 feet um, from the edge of the buildings and aren't, are limited to 50% 50, 50 of the rooftop area. Um, also, we're amending sections related to, par um, to parks and recreation to specify the required tree species and locations um, because some of the tree types currently listed have just not worked in practice. Um, we've met with the Parks and Rec Department and they've, they've outlined some of the problem areas in the downtown plan that are fairly limiting um, to, what, to what they um, would like to do with the landscaping downtown. So the proposed amendments uh, to the downtown plan meet these goals by streamlining both residential and visitor serving development in the downtown, uh, encouraging rooftop open space and amenities, and supporting overall economic development um, by encouraging a mix of uses that are appealing to both residents and visitors, and that allows people to bike, walk, or park and visit a variety of businesses in the downtown in one trip. Um, there are portions of the downtown that are within the coastal zone, and so therefore require approval of a local um, coastal program amendment by the California Coastal Com Commission before they can take effect in that portion of the coastal zone in the downtown. Um, following action by the city council, city staff will prepare an application uh, to the Coastal Commission for approvals. And the local coastal program encourages the expansion of visitor serving accommodations in the coastal zone. And the proposed changes are consistent with those policies which are um, listed in the staff report. Um, let's see, in regards to CEQA, an addendum to the 2017 Downtown Plan Amendments Program EIR has been prepared uh, pursuant to the CEQA guidelines. Um, the program EIR examined essentially the same project that is now being considered by the city. Um, as a result, the amendments would have no new impacts or more severe impacts than previously discussed and analyzed in the adopted program ER, EIR and would not require additional mitigation measures. The subject project and the associated addendum do not prevent the city um, from conducting environmental review uh, on subsequent entitlement requests, nor does it preclude the city from requiring additional mitigation measures for those subsequent, subsequent requests. So next steps, um, should the city council ultimately adopt these edits, um, they will take effect immediately, except for the edits to chapter four, which are part of the LCP. The edits to chapter four um, will take effect immediately outside the coastal zone, but will require approval by a coastal commission before they take effect um, within the coastal zone. So I have a rather long recommendation. I don't know if you want me to Please read it. You read probably it. already read it, so <laughs> I won't go into that. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to hear from everyone, but I've got two kind of quick questions, and then I'll spread it, spread it out. I have three. OK. Um, We were just discussing, we, we've been in contact with the Coastal Commission staff and, and keeping them abreast of, you know, these amendments. And we did receive an email from them that 
there was one change to the language that they wanted us to add, and uh, I I forgot to add that here. In the, uh, it's added in. Yeah, so um, I can probably, yeah, I'll type it up <coughs> on a slide, and then if you guys want to continue to discuss uh, while, I, while I do Let's that. Let's come back to it. I want to make sure all the that, commissioners yeah. see it Sorry about so that. we know what we're voting on. That's fine. Thanks. The Coastal Commission doesn't honor our schedule usually, so. Um, Ryan, I got two quick questions for you. Can I fire them at you? Um, sure. Okay. Love rooftop amenities. Why 15 feet from the edge? Is that a fire department thing? It's more of a visual okay. control. And it, like people falling off, obviously. But it's more uh, of a preventing. It, with it at more of an angle, I mean, at that yeah. height, generally on most heights, yeah, yeah. When you set it back 15 feet, you're not going to see it. Sounds good. There's so much going on on roofs with exterior building maintenance and solar panels and roof decks. Thank you. Um, it's so fun to see this plan evolve because it's worked so well. I love it. Um, why no hotel rooms on the River Walk side? The idea of this was that some active use would be better there. And those that kind of stretch between the corner and down the way, and so I'm fine with it. But I just uh, our thinking was it'd be better to have hotel rooms than empty, unused, tiny retail spaces. And has that thinking changed, or is it just tidying up, or or what's driving that change? I mean, I think the idea was just that is that it's almost you know the equivalent to Pacific or. Yeah. Front Street, you know, having a, a span of, of retail and active areas along the river walk. Fair. It was pretty controversial to talk about ground level residential in that location. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, last question. Does the current hotel have them? I haven't looked at the plans. I don't know if anyone remembers. There's a proposed hotel there. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the question? Does Is there the proposed hotel hmm. on the river walk have hotel rooms on? No. Okay, it's cool. Not. It was amenity spaces, if I remember right. Yeah, it's above, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, let me get the rest of my comments out now. Great progress. This plan is part of how we got to 48.5% affordable units on our last housing element. So it's exciting to see it evolve. Um, comments from other commissioners? I take questions. Uh, Cindy, questions? Um, a couple questions. Uh, one, what does it mean that, I had to write it down, uh, what does it mean that recreational or other active ground uh, for uses must be visible from the street frontage? What does that mean? That recreational or active ground uses must be visible from the street frontage? Again, I think it's about activation of the streets of the streetscape and keeping that, you know, not having any dead spaces along there. So you want to, we want the, those activities and recreation uses to be visible from the sidewalk, from the street. Okay. Um, I think this is just a typo. I just want to point it out that there is, um, I can't, I think it's around page 32 in the document. There's um, a part that talks about affordability and it has 15%. And I think that should be changed to 20. So that's just a type O, I think. Probably just an oversight, yeah. OK, and can you, then. Can you, uh, what page was that? I'm sorry, I missed the page number. You know, when I did the pages, they were different pages. And now the packet does not align. So <laughs> I don't know. I could search for it. I'll, um, I'll search for it right now. OK. Yeah, control F15. Yeah. Um, OK, I had one more question. Let me get organized here. Yeah, so I, I just want to, well, I guess this is a comment. Oh, uh, I, it was about the trees. OK, this was a question. Um, so th there's like a lot of tr uh, change to the tree species and the height and the spacing. Like, And it was a little unclear to me like where those came from and why we're doing those. So could you talk a little bit more about that? We have Travis from our Parks and Rec department who worked on that section, so he can probably speak to that for you. For you. 
Good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for that question and making it worthwhile for me sitting through the previous item. <laughs> it needs to be seen, I suppose. <laughs> um, the, the reason for that change is that the way the downtown plan is currently written is basically the way it was since the original design of downtown took place. And in many ways, it's a description of the landscape plan as implemented. Um, so what we tried to do in the changes, they do appear at many places throughout, but they're simply the same concept repeated in many places, which is where there's a specific recommendation for a specific tree species or type of tree to just refer back to the approved street tree list. And then where there were many different recommendations about spacing in this and that area, consolidate all of that into one comment that said 25 foot spacing on Pacific and 50 or less on the side streets. And the sort of logic behind all of that is to not constrain um, the city or future uh, project developers in being forced to use a specific street tree selection, several of which have not worked out in practice. And that was a recommendation that actually came from our street tree master plan, which was approved by council in 2021. And it is up on the Parks and Recreation webpage. So if you're not familiar with it, please do um, explore it. And one of the key objectives of the plan was to promote species diversity, to build a more sustainable urban forest, and by avoiding monocultural plantings, which is really what's codified in the plan. So that's the logic behind it all. Um, could I just ask you one more question? Um, uh, I, I haven't, haven't actually looked at that plan, but um, it, is there? <coughs> consideration in that plan for um, future climate change and that we're going to be, you know, drier and hotter and those kind of things with the trees that are the tree species that are part of our list? I mean, is, is that Definitely. part of the... Yeah, one of the other objectives, which is on our um, department goals for the year, is to enhance resiliency with a comprehensive tree species palette by updating the approved street tree list. And that's one of the factors to consider is um, climate change and its possible impacts. Great. Um, and that'll be uh, brought before the Parks and Recreation Commission for review when we're ready to present that updated list. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that was definitely worth the wait. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Good question. Street trees are kind of like in an unhospitable environment now, too. You know, they're hot and run over by stuff. Uh, I think three questions for me. Um, can you explain the residential lobbies limitation? I, I feel like activation is important no matter what, um, but if other uses aren't supported economically, um, is there a downside to having residential lobbies be more expensive? What is the limitation? I, I, I don't know what that detail is, first of all. I'm, I'm happy to. to. Yeah. Either way. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. This was something that um, we had uh, extensive discussions on in our um, internal meetings. And um, we ultimately landed on restricting the residential lobbies just on Pacific Avenue, mm -hmm. as you'll see, mm -hmm. um, with, the, um, with the purpose of that being that that is really the prime commercial Sure. Or, um, you know, where we want to have maximum pedestrian activity. And um, we've actually experienced um, pressure from developers to expand their mm -hmm. um, residential lobbies. Right. And um, when you talk about an, an area, whether it's, you know, considered active because they have, you know, some kind of um, lobby space where people are intended to gather yeah. or not, the... Uh, public accessibility of that area mm -hmm. is often not available. Understood. And so mm -hmm. um, those were some of the factors that we took into account. We actually contemplated whether or not um, we should um, allow for publicly accessible um, lobbies to be, um, uh, to be uh, wider. And um, we had concerns about, well, all right, well, what does that mean in practice? Like, someone puts a coffee cart in there, 
and what if that coffee cart's not successful? Um, now we've got a large residential lobby. This is my point that, yeah. you know, with all the best of intentions, you don't necessarily know what the best use is going to be. I remember many decades ago, for several decades, you had all the elders in the St. George kind of hanging out in their living room on Pacific. And it was, I always felt that that was wonderful that you would <laughs> just cruise by and they're all having their probably teacup full of whiskey or whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that similarly to the regulations where, you know, we've always said retail spaces have to be 65 feet deep or whatever they are, those trends have changed because people are having trouble justifying having larger retail spaces that kind of fed into the discussion about the SoCal project. But I, I hesitate to put a, a symbolic limitation on it when, you know, it may come down to, you know, an idea that uh, retail is not as much in demand or something like that. I, I think the, the idea that it's public versus private is compelling. Um, I don't know if there are other ways that you could deal with that, like similar to what you were suggesting, but it's just a question that I had because I, I don't think necessarily that it's, uh, it may be an arbitrary thing. That's my only concern at, with, with any given project. Um, as far as the rooftop amenities go, when you say the 15 foot setback, that's just structures only, right? You're not going to stop people from uh, using that 15 feet on the roof. Is that correct? I think that's awesome. They can't stop you from putting solar panels there, for example. No, definitely not. But I'm just saying, even as a, an amenity space, that's incredible from many of these sites. I, I, I would not want to limit that either. And then um, the concentrated residential language, is that being modified in order to increase opportunities for residential? Is it, it's not, you're, you're not saying that it, the current language is that it needs to be more concentrated, but you're, the, is the suggestion that it will be more diffuse and there will be more opportunities now? Is that is that the basis for it? Or what? It, I just saw a, a bullet point that you're removing the concentrated residential language. That that's correct. Do you want to uh, scroll to that on the the changes? Uh, it, that's correct. We're removing that language, but that is not the um, okay. uh, the outcome. Okay. Um, so uh, what there's a there's a finding that says if there is additional height and we'll, we'll get to it in a second here it says um, you need to make a finding that there is economic and it's just a little bit further down uh, Brian that there are economic it's a little bit further past that just past that I think mm -hmm. um, and oh, just a little bit uh, yeah just a little bit further So, um, yes, the additional height will contribute to an improved social and economic environment by including a concentration of new housing. So what that means is right now, this is one of the findings for additional height criteria. So right now, the code says as a finding that the improved social and economic environment needs to also include a concentration of new housing. So it's removing that requirement. So it doesn't have to have a concentration of new housing. And part of what we noted in the staff report is, you know, what is a concentration of new right. housing? Yeah, I was is, actually thinking of the original downtown plan and because and, I think there is language in there about concentrating housing. And I thought maybe you were sort of saying that that was creating a limitation that you want to remove. That's no, this, this is uh, where that was referenced. I get it. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Conway. I appreciate all of your questions. Um, I might have the page wrong, but the red line, page 87, is allows 50% of the space for a structure. This is on the roof again. Uh, <clears throat> no? Do I have the wrong? I thought it was page 87 with a red line, almost at the very end. Right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yep. Yep. We've got it. Let mm -hmm. me see. That's 87. 87. Yep. Yeah. Did I? Did I read it right? I just wondered. So 50%, I, I agree with you about rooftop amenities. I mean, what a nice place to be and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and all of that. But is 50% <clears throat> a 
a lot like adding an yet another story. I mean, um, the construction at 50% of it. I mean, what are we talking about here? Like cabanas, um, bar, <laughs> what, um, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. I just, I just kind of wondered if it, if it's, it seems like a lot to me. I want the stuff, but I'm just wondering if building it out at 50% is a lot. Probably dependent upon the size of the building too, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it that can't was be one a of the considerations. Other, like a floor, right? It's it, not it, supposed it, to be a floor. Yeah. It's supposed to be. No, it's not, not exactly that it's open and the weather's blowing through it, but I'm, I guess I just. Um, and it can only be 15 feet tall, whatever it is total. Well, so it's another story. So 15 right? feet is, yeah. you know. That one. Mm -hmm. I think the idea was for like shade structures. If you had a rooftop bar or something, some type of amenity like that, yeah. You know, you have uh, so you remember the senior housing one down by Westcliff, uh -huh. Watermark or Water or something uh -huh. or other? They had this really nice little, it's kind of a different thing, but a nice little patio up there with a little trellis uh -huh. for the seniors to sit and drink their whiskey and then solar <laughs> panels on top of it. And staff righteously was like, get that out of there. It's over the height and the neighbor's hate height. And, that's what I want to allow for. Uh -huh. This language seems to allow that to me. Uh -huh. Fifteen feet's enough to get a trellis, and you can do a trellis. You mm -hmm. can do, but it's but you, it's not more. I don't exactly. It's, it's not like it's conditioned space, right? No, it's just structures that enable the use of the roof as an amenity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. as an amenity. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess. And we I talked just, about I like just, decorative. I just fires wanted that to be chewed over a little bit. Yeah. And then, Julie, I want to say again, based on my day job, that like these rooms are so busy with I know, ventilation, so and like if you can squeeze on a little little green mm -hmm. roof, we're happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had a thought though, also um, <laughs> um, on the um, I I I also remember the days of the St. George. I really do think it harkened to a different era. And, Absolutely. And I I feel like <laughs> like leasing offices take a lot of, sp they, I mean, that's dead space, you know. It's often pretty, mm -hmm. and uh, d designers have spent a lot of money on it, you know, but um, it doesn't, it's not active. So I, I kind of like mm -hmm. the um, having, because I, I, I don't think in these these days, I'm just not seeing us, I mean, we don't even watch television together anymore, you know. Um, <laughs> maybe we should drink whiskey and teacups, but um, <laughs> Pluses and minuses. Promoting social, I, I mean, I get that, but I, I kind of like the idea of, of shrinking it because I'd like to see something more active going on there. And that's that's like, you might be transparent, but it's kind of, I don't know, I feel like it's elitist. I guess my point is that, you know, if you have a use downtown that, uh, if you have a space downtown and it's not in demand for something else, mm -hmm. I'm just wanting to provide for the possibility that there is another use that might mm -hmm. activate it. Because the worst thing in my mind is having empty storefronts oh, yeah. or empty yeah, yeah, yeah. retail or, you know, office space. Or worse yet, in my opinion, is the uh, kind of the display panels that create, you know, oh, obscure yeah. windows oh, yeah. that are just, you know, I just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm with you. I, I want to I make it possible for people to uh, utilize the space in a way that is supported so that it doesn't just mm -hmm. sit. Right. That's really that what it comes down to. And if you say you have to limit it to, you know, 15% of this frontage or whatever, then, you know, that's, that's I understand what you're saying about it being, because mm -hmm. I think you're, correct me if I'm wrong, are you referring to residential lobbies only, like, right. or not a... Yeah, I'm talking about residential. Not a hotel lobby or... Yeah, that's, a, that's a whole different okay. thing. Well, uh, that's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. I would like to make sure that it's a dynamic place that allows for yeah. changes in the economy because we make rules that start to get... They start to shift depending on what's happening with, uh, you know, the Internet. <laughs> Basically, I mean... Um, <laughs> Rip Curl is a perfect example because they were in that space in the, the ground floor of the Rittenhouse building mm -hmm. and they said, we have a massive room at the back of our shop that's full of surfboards and we sell, you know, a surfboard a month. Mm -hmm. 
and most of it's online. And so we, you know, we have a lot of lease uh, capital tied up in that and it makes it difficult to have flexibility. So this is just a general comment. I see projects in many jurisdictions, and I got like a 40 foot long, four foot deep, you know, curtain wall, yep. long, narrow lobby, yep. concrete wall, and you're like, yeah. Yep. So people can always cheat and they'll try. But I think this improves it. All right, so quick check in. We have 10 more minutes. Uh, Commissioner Dawson expressed concern about time. Do we want to extend the meeting, or are we feeling close to a? I think we had a motion soon. We could finish this off. I, I definitely have some more comments. Okay, would you like to move to extend the meeting? Could wait till 11. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so you don't feel rushed, you know. Anyway. Um, okay, so uh, this is, I think, a question first and then perhaps a comment. Um, under the additional height stuff, there's all this, uh, there's red line that says, um, Additional height uh, will help meaningfully achieve one or more of the following key objectives. And then we have the red line that says economic development contributions to downtown. Um, that's really different, perhaps, than the other stuff on the list. So the first question is, uh, is economic development contributions to downtown defined in code somewhere? <laughs> No, economic development uh, contributions is not defined um, that I'm aware of. That is um, existing text, but um, it is. Um, so you're, you're talking about B2 here? Yeah, it's where it says. It's in both for the okay. height sections. Yeah. I think it's so on page, your page 73 is one of them. And then 78 is the, yeah, I'm on 78 now. I think it's yeah. the same. It's in both of the yeah. sections. So where it says the additional height will contribute to an improved social and economic environment, is that? Um, well, the one I'm, but yes, that too, which also seems to be undefined, but uh, the one that I am looking at is on page 73, Thank and you. it is um, number five, B, B5. B5. Under Got additional it. height. Zone A. Oh, right. Thank B you. Five. Thank you. Um, so uh, the additional height will meaningfully achieve one or more of the following key community objectives. And we've added economic development contributions to the downtown. Thank you for um, helping me uh, find that location. Um, yes, it, that there is not a, um, a specific def definition to that. Um, I think um, <coughs> the intent there is to allow for um, an opportunity for um, certain types of projects that, that maybe we haven't contemplated at this point that would you know bring a draw to the downtown for example that will help to um, uh, increase foot traffic support the businesses um, not not necessarily that business itself but it could be that business um, same thing if it were a hotel for example that would um, certainly be bringing a wide array of economic development contributions to the downtown with the, the draw that it would have. And so, um, yes, there's, there's not a definition, but I think um, we would need to, that would be one of the ways in which um, we could make the um, determination that um, it is uh, meeting one of those objectives for additional height. So, so currently, as written, something like, um, without these amendments, something like the hotel that is proposed, um, the community credit, I don't remember on Fred Street, what's the address of that proposed hotel? Um, that would not be allowed without these amendments, is that correct? That's not correct. I mean, what this says is the additional height will help meaningfully achieve one or more of the following key community objectives. Mm -hmm. Public right-of-way improvements are included. Publicly accessible open space is included. Public access easements are included. Structured or shared parking is included in that project. So all of those would still be met. Okay. This is just adding that additional um, uh, opportunity to really recognize the importance of economic development and economic development contributions that uh, a project could bring. Yeah, This plan has done it twice after the earthquake and then with the revision. 
Um, I think that's it for right now. I would, uh, if if you don't mind, I uh, I did find that um, reference, um, Commissioner Dawson, to the fifteen percent inclusionary. Mm -hmm. That was a, a holdover. You know, this this plan um, when it was last updated actually um, was in twenty twenty when we had um, the when right when we were making those same changes. Mm -hmm. um, but we can, I think what we can do is, is clean that up as part of this and just strike the 15% and say include the, uh, or maintain the inclusionary requirement. Okay. I strongly Thank support that, that's a yeah. good idea. Thank you. I, I actually did have one other thing, I, I apologize. No apology, no. Um, okay, so looks like we're, adding some level of review <clears throat> for particular projects, um, which I think is great. Um, and then we're also uh, removing some level of review for the 60 SROs. Is that right? Is that ringing a bell? Section eliminates the requirement for special use for SRU, can we look at that section really quick? That's the upper level table, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Yes, so on the upper level, yep. Um, so, yes. Um, your point of adding reviews, um, I believe that the only place that we are adding is where we say, um, the additional height request requires planning commission Mission, yeah. recommendation. Mm -hmm. Right now, it is just planning director recommendation. And um, we have encouraged applicants to come to the planning commission um, on those projects um, because we, we want to get that feedback and get your recommendations on that. Um, and so this would just set us in line and eliminate those questions <laughs> that we have with the applicants about yeah. where is it going. So um, that's the intent there. For here, um, really what we were looking at is, um, again, this is the upper floors. And on the upper floors, we're looking at how to support um, residential uses um, on those upper floors. And um, this is actually something that um, we're uh, in, coordination with the State Department of Housing and Community Development on a regular basis with, um, as it relates to our housing element and uh, them pushing us to um, remove procedural um, encumbrances, right? This does not mean that there isn't a requirement for a permit. This means that uh, they still have to go through the design permit. They just wouldn't have to do the administrative use permit. And I think one of the things that's important to consider here is when we're talking about a use permit versus a design permit is that you're not, um, it, with a use permit, you would be putting conditions on the use. And um, with residential uses, you know, there aren't a whole lot of conditions that we put on, on the use of that. Um, and so the, the use permit isn't always matched well with, with residential. And we've got a lot of instances in our code and so we're seeking to clean up some of those instances where we're looking at the design of the building and not um, how that is necessarily used. And so we're not going to revoke a use permit and say you can no longer use it as residential when it's built as residential. Okay. Could we go to page 44? It's the, like at the bottom of page 44, which is the change in the actual language around special use. Yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. So I just, it seems to me that that these changes, you know, I mean, that's that's a significant change under CEQA to me. Like, well, why isn't that a significant change, eliminating that? There, there really isn't a change under CEQA. I mean, if it's a project, that requires discretionary review, the city the city's still obligated to do a CEQA review. So it, it, it does nothing um, to the CEQA process whatsoever. It's just the, what type of permit they go through, a design permit versus a use permit. 
All right, and now's the time for that motion. It's 59. Okay, I, I move we extend the meeting by 15 minutes. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, this was given for a decision. Yeah, I, I don't know. To me, this seems like a pretty significant change. I mean, in, in reality, most of the projects that you're seeing downtown um, are asking for additional height, in which case it would come to the Planning Commission. Many of them require density bonuses, comes to the Planning Commission. So, you know, we're not really seeing a lot of projects that are um, uh, approved at the staff level, you know, in the downtown. It's just, it's, it's, it's like uh, the director was saying, um, you know, when you have a, a use permit requirement for a residential use, you know, the conditions are very limited, and in reality, you're really not going to be revoking a use permit and getting rid of units. So it's just not um, it's sort of a superfluous process. I, you know, I, I thought this sounded like a great idea because it seemed like a totally extra thing. It's more like it was a restaurant, and now it's going to be a tattoo parlor. Or a, uh, that's a little controversial. Or a hair salon, you know. I mean, that's what I thought, thought of as a residential, or a, as a, the use. Right. The administrative use permit is yeah. is that type of use. You're not going to build something as housing and create it, m turn it commercial with a low level approval or vice versa for that matter, which we probably will be talking about converting office space to housing. That's a much higher level change. So I saw this as being a simplification and removing an obstacle. Well. You're talking about the administrative <laughs> permit, which is not what this is the special use requirement. Oh, the special use. Yeah, yeah. So I, I agree with you there. I think that the administrative use is totally redundant, and this is a this is a different this is removing a different requirement around a special use permit. I don't see the issue. You explain again why? Because to, to me, it seems like it makes sense. Um, residential. We want the staff to explain their logic one more time or my logic? I don't understand your logic. <laughs> I, I, th this just seems like a significant change to me. That's, I mean, that's what it comes down to me. I, I don't think this is redundant. And, you know, I think we just have a different uh, difference of opinion. I mean, I can't really say it other than I, I do think it's a significant change. And, um, They've given you their reasons why they think it's not. So I think we could just move on from there. Okay. So that, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't I'm think there's anything okay. more to discuss around it. Okay. <laughs> I'm good with that. All right. Any further discussion, motion? How are people feeling? I'm a little tired myself. Did you want to see if there's any uh, public input? Absolutely. I just reminded, uh, you guys just reminded me of that. Uh, before we move to voting, uh, we'd like to open this up for the public. Uh, Candace, Owen, or anyone else want to come on up and speak? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment. Thanks again for the reminder. And do we have a motion? I, I would just note, um, Ryan, did you add that section that we no, talked right. about yeah, with I the did. Postal Commission? Can, yeah. That was in the Thanks for finding that 15%. Appreciate that. Yeah. Of course. Thanks for pointing it out. Yeah. I'm writing this point, and there is zero. Okay, so this is the change. So the purple is what was a suggested addition by Coastal. That's great, love it. We didn't really have any issue with it. Yeah. Right, which is exactly the original intent of all of yeah, that anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree. Just I think that's really restating that. Really clarification. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, really quickly, if we could go down to um, the rooftop amenity section. I just want to clear some. I had most of my questions answered about this before the meeting, but I just wanted to make sure that there's no. Um, 
I guess, possibility that this can be interpreted as adding another floor. So, for example, should there be language in there about condition space? Should there be, you know, something around that? Um, I don't know. In my conversations with staff, Ryan, thanks again so much for working this out with me. Um, it, it seems sufficiently broad to allow a lot of different uses, but I just want to make sure this can't be interpreted like, you know, developer comes in and asks for 50% you know, density bonus and now we're looking at a 10 story building and they're like, oh, but this isn't, you know, another floor, it's a rooftop amenity, so you know, this is going to be even higher. So, I mean, I just want to make I, sure that we're... I can respond quickly. Yeah. When we wrote it, uh, everyone explained that if you put an apartment up there, you need fire, ladder, you know, right. elevator, there's all sorts of these other things that come that would make it hard to, to misuse this. You would hmm. need an elevator for amenities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Sorry. Yeah, more just a question than anything else. Yeah. Just there's all this controversy around height and density bonuses anyways, and we don't want to, you know, um, provide room for that be to be misleading. I had a um, similar response at first because we worked so hard on, first we wanted to have sort of a gradual increase, and we wanted to make sure there was it was broken up and there was articulation and all of that. So I did have a similar response, mm -hmm. but I, I feel comfortable with it. Okay. And, yeah. I, I would just say, um, as, as we're talking through it, the, um, it, we've got the um, amenities here, and, um, you know, there may be, as with the elevator and, and so forth. You would have to do that anyway. Yes, you're right. So you may have some of those, those facilities. Yeah, and the part that I thought might have covered this was, you know, such variation shall be minor in nature. I mean, that is you know, left to interpretation, but I, I think it might cover it. And I don't know, I'm just looking for your, and yeah, my that, colleague's opinion. That that was intentional um, when we were thinking about that, and especially I think it's getting at uh, Commissioner Conway's comment about the 50%, you know, if, if we've got 50% covered by shade structures, that's very different than 50% of the rooftop that is a, a conditioned space, right? If we've got a rooftop bar and there's a, a, a walk-in cooler um, or a, a space, mm. uh, you know, that may be conditioned space, but it may be a, a small portion. So there it's, it's minor in nature. And so that yeah. was something that was taken into consideration and why, why we included that additional text. Before. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And then you have the planning commission and the city council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it out, right? there, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, um, use judgment to, yeah, sniff it out to make sure it passes the smell test. Okay, I'm good. I'll move the uh, staff recommendation. I'm, uh, can we bring that language back up just so the public is clear on what we're doing here tonight and us? <laughs> uh, oh, for the recommendation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I assume that got, yeah, okay. I should read it over one time. I'm not going to read all that, but. Uh, can, I, can I ask one more question? Is there any requirement for any of those amenities to be public? No. At this point, there's not. Um, you know, if it were a, a residential rooftop, for example, there, there would happens, likely be a desire. All over to the have, world. Well, th yeah, there would likely be a desire to be um, uh, private. Mm -hmm. um, and you know there are um, there are in San Francisco, for example, buildings where you can access those rooftops. Yeah. Um, we should pass that law. In this in this text, there is not any requirement for those to be public. That's not to say that they wouldn't necessarily be. Um, I would be for that, but it, but if a developer wanted, say, to make it public, they could do so. Uh, absolutely. So you know, I think about yeah. the paradox hotel right. that you know you can go to the pool you can go to the restaurant and you know, if I, have, were, I have weird dreams of there being like a small soccer field on top of a building one day I, mean, I don't know if that's ever going to happen but you know that'd be great would you be uh, satisfied with bocce ball yeah <laughs> <laughs> only if i had a cup of tea and whiskey right with the old people they used to play basketball on top of the old jail so you know. that's right yeah okay so um mm -hmm. we need a second made, on that you, you're moving the staff recommendation uh as um do i need to as amended yeah, or because the there yeah, was as amended. As amended. with the purple language and um, perhaps the, the changing of the 15 to 
20. Oh, okay. So is yes, that, the staff is, recommendation as amended with the uh, correction. 15% corrected to 20%, we're, we're correct? Just actually, uh, it might be best just to strike the 15% so it's whatever the inclusionary is because right. that could yes. change yeah. over time. Yes. Then we don't have to update every day. Okay. Um, I would be happy with that change. So can we just say the current inclusionary or just make it really clear that whatever is in code currently? In effect at that time. And then you don't have to go back and clean yeah. it up. So I moved. Next. Did anybody second yet? No, we need no, a second. I will second. Seconded by Commissioner Conway. Any further discussion? Oh, uh, one thought was like a massive art thing up there. We don't have that yet, but that would be awesome. Uh, we could use that to approve something like that if we loved it. I'm all for it. So including joke and we're becoming a yeah, city here. It'd be cool. 15 mm -hmm. foot high art installations yep, could yep, yep, yep. possibly be there too. It'd be cool. So yes, okay. moved, seconded. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Tess? Commissioner Conway, aye. Dawson, nope. McKelvey, aye. Polhamus, aye. Kennedy, aye. All right. Uh, do we have any informational items this evening? Calendar. Yes. We, we do. Five minutes worth or more? I, I hope we can do it in less than five minutes. Go. <laughs> um, I, I'll start off with mine. Um, we um, just finished a survey for the downtown plan, and um, the next step of engagement is actually to do focus groups. And we would like to invite, we have seven focus groups, and coincidentally, we have seven planning commissioners. We would like to invite one planning commissioner to each of those focus groups. Um, and I um, have the dates here for those. Um, they are um, let's see. between uh, they are Monday, October 2nd, Tuesday, October 3rd, the Wednesday, the 4th, and Thursday, the 5th. And then the next week, they are. Monday um, the 9th, Wednesday the 11th, and Thursday the 12th. So four days, Monday to Thursday, the week of October 2nd, and then Monday, Wednesday, Thursday the next. The first question I have um, is whether or not any of the commissioners are fluent in Spanish, because we do have one that is um, a meeting uh, with our um, Beach Flats and Lower Ocean residents that we will be hosting. That will be the only one that is not here at City Hall, and that is on Thursday, October 12th. Aprendí mucho español en Argentina, pero fluente en... no. Pero es mejor de yo. Es mejor de los otros. Todo es en el acento, señor. Gracias. Entonces, uh, octubre, uh, 12 de octubre, a las 7... In la noche. <laughs> uh, I guess I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I we'll see how much I pick up. Okay. Great. That. Um, so we will um, mark you down for that. Thank you very much for that. Um, and then um, I will let you know what the others are, and then you can decide. So Monday. October 2nd, streetscapes and public spaces. Tuesday, October 3rd, mobility and beach connection. Wednesday, October 4th, building design. Thursday, October 5th, uses of the arena and public plazas. And um, then on to the next week. Monday, October 9th, downtown residence. Um, October the 11th is Beach Hill residence. And then the 12th is the Spanish language with beach flats and lower ocean. I'm sorry, what was the 11th? The 11th is uh, Beach Hill Residence. Did you want us to claim one? I would love it if you claimed one, and that will save us. Um, I would go to the 4th, unless John wants to go. Or Tim Murray is not here. <sighs> that's I fine. No, that's fine. Um, what was the 3rd again? I'm sorry. The 3rd is Mobility and Beach Connection. Okay. I would take that one. No one is That's jumping cool. at it. Okay. Was the second? The second is streetscapes and public spaces. They were all so good. I would claim that one. Okay. Unless someone else wants it. That's great. We got 
4th, 5th, 9th, and 11th, all from 6 to 7.30. Are all these 6 to 7.30? 6 to 7.30, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what did I say? The fourth. Oh, but I'm totally flexible, Cindy, if you want to swap. No, I'm just, two of us can go, too. So there's four left? Fifth, ninth, there, are, there are three left. The fifth, ninth, and eleventh. The twelfth is Commissioner Paul. Uh, the fifth is uses of the arena and public plaza. The ninth is downtown residents. The eleventh is Beach Hill residents. Beach Hill residents is always a fun party. You might want to Great. And, and just a quick question. There will be availability of a translator there? <laughs> I got about fifth, sixth grade level Spanish. We so, have, you know. We, um, we, have, we will have a bilingual individual there. Um, I will look into that for you. We need more Spanish speakers on this. Great. All right, did we do it? Uh, I believe so. Yes, all of you have signed up, and we will connect with the other two commissioners. Thank you so much yeah. for doing that. All right, right so on the nick of time. Do we need more minutes, or are we adjourning? You want to talk about schedule? Uh, yeah, I can do schedule. Yeah, okay. Please okay. extend the meeting. Seconds. Seconds. I'm going to move that we extend by five minutes. Second. Sweet. All Aye. those in favor? Aye. 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 So the Windsor project that uh, you heard last August was appealed to council. It's going to be heard on the uh, 10th of October. Um, upcoming agendas, nothing scheduled for October 5th. Um, for the 19th, we have a couple potential items, one involving an outdoor dining ordinance and then another potential oh, yeah. uh, ordinance involving uh, new construction decarbonization. Um, and then out in November, um, you can expect to have the housing element before you. Exciting. The decarb is the response to the lawsuit, huh? Right. That that's correct. Yeah, it's it soon, quickly. it's, yes. it's uh, a ten at a time. We're still working on I'm that, so but excited. um yeah. we're we're trying to get it to that second meeting in October. Has anybody tried to submit a gas building in the loophole? I, don't, I haven't heard of anybody. We we've had questions yeah. from some small developments. I, I haven't seen um, cool. large ones. Yeah, I don't care about the wolf stove, I mean the big ones. <laughs> Um, excellent. With that, I, uh, I will thank everybody. Long meeting and great work, everybody. And then we'll adjourn this meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you.